with all that's going on in the sport, all the things going on, all the, uh, I don't know, animosity, polarizing topics, there were some cool things that happened in the kayak world this past week that I think might be interesting to all of us. And uh, we're going to bring in a guy that's kind of a, a bad dude when it comes on the kayak scene. And he's got a pretty unique, fresh approach, I think, to how he attacks kayak tournaments. And I think it'll be a fun talk. And we'll probably preview the Classic Expo, too, because that's where I bumped into him this past weekend. What's up, Drew? What's up, guys? Glad to be on the show, man. Absolutely. So, Drew Gregory, I, like I was just telling you before the show, I'm not a hardcore kayak angler. I don't know if there's fantasy fishing for kayaks. If there is, maybe I would get more interested or maybe I would start following it. There but, used to be. There used to be. Yeah. I started it, dude. I started it from a website that you could fantasizer.com. You could build a fantasy league out of whatever you want. I started it. Handed it off to some other folks. It was like going for three years and it was keeping track of the money earned. That was fantasy points, mm. money earned. It was cool. But uh, those yeah. people uh, didn't, I guess, didn't continue it. So it was a lot, it was a lot of work, but it was fun. We all had a good time with it, but used to be. But one thing I can tell you is as I loosely follow some of the kayak stuff, Drew Gregory is a name that comes up a lot more often than it doesn't and you seem to be pretty bad dude when it comes to tournaments you're definitely one of those i don't know how many there's a handful of names but you're definitely in that misc with christine fisher and about yep. five or six other anglers Rust, that are yep. uh, always in the mix uh when it comes to wins and top tens and cash and checks yeah i mean it's it's one of those things where it's it's definitely harder to break through and get known more in the bass fishing world and realm from you know going the kayak route takes a little bit more time a little a few more wins i mean bro an hour ago i looked on my instagram and it said mark zona is now following you okay i've got nine national wins a bassmaster aoi a hobie aoi bassmaster championship finally that's all it takes to get zona to follow you just go <laughs> win nine times and make sure two of two aois and a, and a championship are in there and, and but anyway i, I joking aside so we're, we're pushing our way into kind of a little bit more mainstream relevance in the, in the bass fishing world. And it's a good thing. Hopefully I can use this platform to push it even further for those that follow in my footsteps. Yeah, absolutely. So there's, there's definitely a bunch of people in my audience that, uh, let's <laughs> see another comment. I got to look at this. Uh, yeah. I'm going to start, start watching start the comments there's too. A, there's a good one there. Um, there's a definitely a crossover. I think you have a fresh approach. I've seen you on Bailey's show and a few other shows. And I think, I just feel like we would vibe. So we bumped into each other at the expo and I was like, it's always, you know, it's, you can reach out to people on Instagram and slide in their DMS, but it's, it's just cool when you can be like, meet them in person and ask them and then follow up later. So, uh, yeah, but you're coming is. off a big win. Well, tell us like you just won. I don't what it's the the Bassmaster yeah. championship that coincides right. with the Bassmaster classic, right? Exactly. So that's our classic. I mean, that's our championship. Now they technically wouldn't let us use the word classic when we were, we were titling ours. You know, the one to leave classic for the bass boats. That makes sense. So ours is not really, some people call it the Bassmaster Kayak Classic. Technically, it's a championship. And basically, it's a culmination. Just like the elites, you qualify through 2023 season, right? Through uh, the AOI standings. Or if you, you can auto qualify if you, have, I believe, I can't remember if it's a top three or five or uh, at each event. There's five regular season events and then the championship. So there's six total. And so, yeah, basically this is our culmination. It, we get to be on the big stage, on the classic stage on Friday. Our tournament is Wednesday and Thursday every year. So we're just right before. And then, of course, we have to, you know, I had to sleep on not knowing if I'd won or not because our leaderboard cuts off an hour before, uh, you know, lines out time. And we don't have to upload live. If you don't have a cell phone signal, you don't upload your fish live. And we go by link, best five. So I had to kind of sleep on that, but uh, until Friday on the big stage, the Bassmaster Classic stage, day one of the weigh-in for the for the boater side, and obviously right before they they do that, we go on and get to take the big stage and, and at least share our passion about kayak fishing with the rest of the world. Uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. And you did you update live? I mostly updated live. Uh, so I was. It's making some long runs. You guys are probably laughing in the comments, joke, long runs. And I'm going, you know, five miles an hour upstream this river. I can go 6.7 with my Torquedo, but I'm, I'm getting into places in a Keith Poche style way that, that you guys can't, you know, in the boats. And that's why I got into kayak fishing. But I actually uploaded during some of my long runs when I didn't have to be paying attention to how shallow it was. And in some of these like swift sections, little riffles and swift stuff that I had to attain. 
and use a paddle along with my Torquedo on high. So yeah, I uploaded kind of live, you know what I mean? Semi live. Cause I don't want to waste time. I don't want to waste one single cast. I don't check the standings. Typically I don't look unless I'm just you know motoring to another, another spot. So uh, I did have a, a three and a half inch lead when the board went off, but in, in kayak tournaments, you actually just don't know. Cause some people don't upload their fish at all. Cause they don't have signal or maybe they're just sandbagging or they caught the fish actually just in the last hour. So that's why we didn't see it when the board cut off an hour before. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was nervous and I actually didn't know if I won until right then and there. So it was pretty wild and a, a crazy feeling. Cause I've always wanted a championship, you know, won some AOIs, but never a championship, lots of other national level events, but man, it's like any elite angler. You want the classic. That's what you want. You get one shot a year at it. If that, if you even qualify, but uh, so yeah, kind of dream come true weight lifted off the shoulders kind of thing for me. So super blessed, super fortunate. Yeah. So for those, I, I think some of the series have different regulations, but what is the, what is the, the, the vessel requirements yeah. or regulations for the Bassmaster? Oh, great question, Aaron. I mean, it's gotta be, you know, marketed as a kayak, a paddle craft, something you can paddle or, you know, and or motor. I mean, like as long as you're, it's paddle as part of it, you know what I mean? Or pedal. So you got a lot of companies out there, your Hobies, you know, Bonafide, Native Watercraft, Old Town, they all make a lot of companies, Jackson, make good pedal drive kayaks, but they either need to be marketed and, and typically of rotomolded material. There's some other materials that are allowed, but basically marketed as something you can just kind of solo push, pull, paddle. And uh, yeah, there's you can read it in the Bassmaster Kayak Series rules. Go to Bassmaster.com, click on tournaments, click on kayak, and then read the rules. And you can find out all the regulations on the length. Sure. Uh, of them and all that stuff. The, the minimum, the maximum. Like Bassmaster allows electric propulsion. They do. Right. They do. Some, the Hobie series used to not. They do this year, but uh, in the okay. history of that series, they did not. It was man powered only. But now, uh, this year, pretty much every series, major series out there allows electric propulsion and it, but it's no bigger than a, a three horsepower. I don't know what, I can't remember what pound thrust that is, but. The uh, Torquedo 1103 I use is basically a three horsepower equivalent. It's it's essentially what a, a 109 pound thrust, you know, motor guide or Mincota or the new power pole move. They're all basically around that three horsepower. So, yeah, okay. really good. So, there is a lot of tech uh, on kayaks from motors to electronics, things like that. Kind of give a little bit of your philosophy and how you attack lakes. So I think how what you, I mean, I think there's other right. people that do what you do, but you're not, I mean, I, I think like, let's say Bailey, right. Uh, who's been yeah, on this show before. Example. He's much more of like, he's got like mega live. He might have mega 360 on his kayak. He's got like three units. He's got lots of things. What's, and he likes to fish offshore and look right. for schools and things like that. How do you attack these fisheries? I mean, yeah, for the most part, Aaron, I mean, you got another good question there. You're on fire, bro. So look, kayak is no different than bass boats. They're all just tools for the, for the water that you want to fish. Right. So me personally, again, think I'm trying to use You know, the bass boat world analogy. I follow that world as close as probably anybody out there. Huge fan of all that stuff and those guys, but Poche has a boat specific for getting shallow and skinny, you know, to get those few tournaments where it really can help him play. It, it helps him. And you've noticed that, you know, he's had the win over there last year. So that's kind of my approach. I keep it stripped down simple. I don't use any graphs. I've won everything I've won without a graph and most of it without a motor, even in the series that allowed motors. But now, you know, they, they did change it to where we have, we have designated launches this year. So, or last year, I think that started. So now then you have a designated launch and you can't launch up the Creek, but at the bridge or whatever, at other public places that are, you know, as long as they're public is what it used to be you kind of have to have a motor now. So I do have a motor, the Torquedo, but they have multiple launches, right? Like, yes. There's a lot of launches long. all over the, the lake. Yeah. All over. So yeah. basically you want to set up your kayak for what, what you love to do in my style, my personality. I, the reason I got into kayak fishing to begin with, you know, go back 15, you know, whatever it was, 2004, I don't know how many years ago that is now, but ever since I got into kayak fishing, it was literally because I am passionate and fell in love with fishing rivers and creeks and just backwater and places that boats can't get because at that point, and, and already you guys know what I'm talking about. The lakes are crowded. I mean, so crowded with boats. I was looking for ways to get away and find fish that just aren't pressured. And I was wade fishing rivers and creeks, love doing it all my life. And the kayak is literally just the best tool for it. So I continue to fish 
the way that I fell in love with kayak fishing, even in a competitive setting. I seek out the, the water that fits my style. It actually helps me quickly eliminate a ton of the, the lake, right? A lot of the water. So that's, that's just kind of, that was a good question, Aaron. Basically just whatever suits your personality, your style and the beauty of, of bass fishing. The coolest thing about bass fishing to me, whether you're a boater or a kayaker is the fact that this little green fish or brown fish can live shallow. It can live in vegetation. It can live deep. It can live in current. It can live in muddy water. It can live on rocks. It can live on wood. It can live on docks anywhere. And that's, what's cool is we get to choose our own personalities and our own styles on how we target them. And in the kayak world, it's a little, it's still a little easier to fish the way I do and have some success. It's getting harder, <laughs> much harder in the bass boat world. You kind of need to almost be looking down on the screen these days because uh, you're going to probably notice 75 to 85 percent of your events are probably going to be one that way these days. And and we can still get away with not doing that quite yet. But Bailey and others, man, if that's what you love to do and you enjoy looking down at the screen, have three graphs and live scope and, and technology. It's just, that's awesome. I mean, I celebrate everyone's style and their diversity, whatever makes you happy and helps you catch more fish and gives you more joy being outside in God's creation. That's, that's great. I just was trying to get away from screens. You know what? I got into fishing to kind of get away from it. So, you know. Yeah. I don't think that's allowed. Drew, actually, I think you're supposed to only tell people what they're doing wrong. And <laughs> close them. Like, so your approach is completely, you're, you're just going to have to pick a side and, and tell everybody else they're wrong. It's right on point, dude. Right on brand yeah. lately in this world. That's, that's, that's what it's become, right? I'm trying to spread the, like the love and positivity of like, if we can accept everyone's style. Now there is a point we got to roll this, this lives, this technology back. I mean, golf balls are the, you know, the USGA, uh, you know, PJ tour, the rolling the golf ball back for 2026, sell all the golf balls that are made now, but at some point we can't let this ball just keep flying over all the obstacles, which were the original strategy and intent of the golf course. We're overpowering it. So the intent of the original intent of the sport is now gone. You know, how far rich you might, you know, I'm sure you have opinions on it, but yeah, how far, you know, until we hit that point, if we're not already there until the original intent of the sport. And the pastime that made it so special, you know, a lot of the mystery and, you know, using the the world and everything you can kind of learn and, and not, you know, you can see with your eyes on a bed fish and, and sight fish, but this is using some artificial form of technology where you're seeing them in another way that you normally as a predator and prey situation would not be able to do. So at what point are we losing that original intent, which is, I think is what kind of burns a lot of the, the old timers, sure. you know, it's like, uh, Andy Montgomery said it pretty good. He used to drive around with that Atlas and Gazetteer, you know, and I got turned right on Highway 54 and and all of a sudden it makes it so simple when you have a GPS, you just pop it up to your your car and now it's just quick in that learning curve and it made it so simple. So anyway, that may be another topic for, man, he's trying to get us off on that tangent, I'm sure, but uh, <laughs> yeah, easy to, that, days, easy, easy to do these days. Ask Kayak and Beer on Instagram says hi, so what's up? Um, what's but yeah, on, I I don't want to see it go much further. I think I, th I fear that we get to a point where AI starts to combine with front facing sonar and it can start to interpret the, the hardness of a tone and a shape of a dot that then it be actually can tell the difference 100% between a crappie and a drum and a catfish and a bass. And We're then there. I think that's probably there. too far. Yeah, yeah, it's a little too far, man. We're you got to stop at some point, man. It's just gonna. That's the biggest concern. My big, you know what my bigger issue is. I'll be honest with you guys. I love live scope. It keeps people off the bank. It helps us catch fish we've never caught before. And, and you can't argue that catching more fish on live is got to is going to be better. More fish catches is certainly better on a sport that's that is over you know eight hours or nine hours like golf. Those are hard to watch. You know, football and basketball and soccer things are a little shorter you know, they're easier to watch and, and digest. It's hard, you know, bass fishing is like golf in the sense that it's fun to do it. Watching it is not as, not necessarily as fun, but at some point uh, we definitely have to just figure out where that line is, uh, you know, for sure. So I don't I think, know. I mean, the sport, the sport's still young. We're figuring it out. Kayak fishing is still even younger, right? Yeah. They're still figuring that out right there. They're trying to decide Absolutely. should mo motors be allowed? Should they not? You know, at what point is a kayak too long to be a kayak, right? Like, I mean, yeah. there's there's things you guys are figuring out, I'm sure, too. <laughs> yeah, that people need to be patient with these series, honestly, with the lease. They're doing their best because, they, you know, their their best interest is the future of the sport. 
And the NFL is changing rules right now like they do every year. They just changed like four or five rules, the kickoff, the hip drop tackle. All the, They're changing all the rules. They're still di- like refining their sport. But I know one thing. Every sport that's successful has found a way to be good on TV and lowest cost of entry possible. Like soccer, super low cost of entry. It's not a surprise. It's the biggest sport on the planet, right? It's a ball that a little kid can get good. And it's just the equipment he needs to get good. He's got it without hardly spending any money. You can come from, from nothing and, and learn how to kick a soccer ball and play. Uh, you know, look at, look at, you know, even baseball, just a glove and a bat. There's not a ton to it. You, you obviously got to pay to play in a league, but most sports have learned to be, you know, success or that are very successful or good on TV and they're good. Um, you know, in terms of lowest cost cost of entry. And that's where we're, that's where that crux that we're sort of like up against is, well, if every tournament's won by that technology, you kind of are saying you got to have it. If you got to have it and on a bass boat, bass boat already costs, you know, 50, 60, 70, 120,000 dollars plus, plus all that technology. Now you're adding another 30. How's a kid that's walking the bank in his neighborhood ever going to have the money to get that technology to ever get that level? It's kind of like F1 racing, uh, polo, just name any sport that's super expensive. You got to own horses, horse racing, and then pro bass fishing. So the more you can get that down, the like cost of entry, in my opinion, and I, I mean, I'm obviously a fan of the sport, but my master's degree is also in sports management. So I'm not a dummy when it comes to like sports and understanding what makes them great, what makes them work and, and tick. And I know bass masters working their best on this stuff and, and going to figure it out. But if we figured out how to make it good on TV, and what I, my biggest, I guess that's what I was getting at, Rich. My bi- biggest concern, guys, isn't forward facing sonar. It's definitely that, that we got to cut it at some point. But what it really is, get this if that's legal and it's that dominant, remember we thought the A rig was going to like just take over and every tournament was going to be won by it. So we banned it. Oh, we don't want every tournament to be predictable. Wait a second. Aren't, isn't it kind of predictable now? It's like, for, it's like a clue. You know, it's like, you know, it was. Who you know in the ballroom by this scarlet with the candlestick? We know it's like okay, forward facing sonar. You know the only difference is what bait's it going to be a or a- with? <laughs> yeah, exactly. These three, four, you know, weapons. So my bigger issue is not forward facing sonar. That's great. It helps us catch more fish that we didn't know were there. We're learning. They're suspended. They're chasing bait. It's it's if that's legal, why don't we give some of the stuff that we took away back to the shallow water guys? Why don't you get a two foot standing platform? Why, why isn't that legal? Like a skiff? Why isn't a, a tunnel hole legal? Why isn't a, a jet prop legal? Why isn't uh, you know, anything like that? A rig They're All of those things combined. Would you not agree, Rich, that all of those things I just mentioned combined aren't as powerful as forward facing sonar is to combine. They aren't as far powerful as forward facing sure. sonar. So why would we not? bring those things back, give us, give some of those old school shallow water guys a fighting chance. And from visually for the, for us, the viewers, we get to cut away from a, a, a scene that people are calling boring, you know, sit staring down on a screen in the open water more often to hopefully a guy up shallow somewhere he was able to get because he had a tunnel hole or because he had, you know, a recite fishing standing up on a, a platform and he can see him better with his eyes now. Or neighbor. So I would think that'd be cool because it gives us some more of a dynamic. It'd be like taking away the taking away the pass and football would suck. Every play would be a run, right? I mean, that would not be exciting. What boring. The cool thing about football is you can do pass, you can do run, uh, you can kick field goals. There's lots of ways to score. If you start limiting the ways to score and it's very predictable, football is all a run. It just becomes boring. It becomes rugby. It's not even the same sport. That's kind of where we're getting. It's like, man, this sport, we don't want it to be boring where it's just so – predictable that it's like ah oh, god it's just up oh, forward facing sonar again so i think they should bring the other stuff back man that shallow water yeah. a lot of these other techniques and, and things they outlawed in the past back but yeah, I I think there's a couple things to unpack there i think the the cost right to, to get into bass fishing i guess tournament bass fishing is extremely expensive there there's no arguing that um you know kayak helps but kayaks they're still way more expensive than a soccer ball. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they're, yeah. I think, I mean, really, if we really want to expand the sport, I think getting people interested at the, the, the very entry level, I think, you know, promoting some of those online tournaments here at those uh, virtual yeah. tournaments that people can fish from the banks, you know, people that can go to their, mm-hmm. you know, where you have, you know, go into a pond and taking your bike or walk into a pond gives you an advantage over somebody else. That's probably. Right even a bigger key to getting more people involved in let's call it competitive 
fishing, right? Like, right. Uh, I mean, kind of like it'd be like the difference between online poker versus sitting down at a table in Vegas, right? Yeah. Not everybody's going to be able to go to Vegas, but anybody can jump on their their laptop or their phone and play online poker at home, right? So, yeah. from from a barrier to entry, that that's probably the next step beyond even kayak fishing to give right. accessibility to people. Um, yeah. And I think to me, limiting the tech on the high end flattens the curve of how fast it's getting away from us. Right. I think limiting the screen inches and the number of transducers, just, you know, hopefully we can keep the bass boats, you know, closer to a hundred and further away from 150 for a while, I guess. Um, yeah. Hopefully, man. And then, your second thing, I do think, I, I think the A-Rig should come back. I think, you know, the double fluke rig, like, oh, I, yeah. I think some of these other things. Two rods at one the, time? What the line is, as far as opening the rules on, you know, you know, the other stuff, as far as, like, jumping and pushing and right. safety. and Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, yeah. there's gray. But I think something to, to kind of try to swing it back the other way would be good. Be um, yeah. They you know, might maybe, to... maybe not require the guys to fish the same vessel all year long right right now you if exactly. you start the year with a tin boat you have to stay at a tin boat all year if you start the year in a glass boat you guys like even like john sukup had an unfortunate accident at lake fork where he ripped a hull in his new blazer in a hull right he's got a perfectly good 21 foot express which is not a it's not a poche tin boat right like he couldn't use right. it because it's the big. way the rules were written even though he had a perfectly good Eighty thousand dollar bass boat sitting in Oklahoma, he could have went and got. He couldn't use it because of the way the rules. Um, exactly. Yep. So I, yeah, we should. I, I think some of that, you know, some of that stuff that Mark Menendez did, getting in, you know, in Arkansas, the Gray Lake or whatever it was. Yeah. Getting oh yeah, I remember rocks. Dardanelle when he went Dardanelle under the under the bridge, Dardanelle, that small that's boat. That's what it was. Yeah, yeah. he went under that bridge. Um, and that's that's cool. It's fun. It's creative. It's it's clever stuff. It's it's the kind of way. I love to fish and uh, yeah, I think it's, it's entertaining visually. I mean, I can pull up a video if you will we'll show some videos if you want. I got plenty of it here sure. and um, of, you know, the big bass for this tournament. I'll, I'll present this, uh, you know, what you're doing on the back end there. So you can, but this is the big bass of the tournament uh, up the river. The, the slew, this is on day two on the slew. I started in, it had a lot of good large mouth. Um, so I caught a big small cool. mouth, nearly six pound small mouth too, that I can show you guys, but this is a uh, yeah, I, I think when this is going, I don't think they'll be able to hear us. So, I think they will. Maybe not. Yeah, I mean, I hear you. Okay, maybe we can. I yeah, can now. put a video up once when I was on with him and I couldn't hear anything, so maybe yeah. he just did That's a slough back there. You see, that's not the river. That's actually a back cut slough. So largemouth love that kind of obviously slack or slower water. They're lazier. It's a, about a six and a half pounder, 22 inch. Yes! Had a lamprey on it and that lamprey fell off. Oh, my old faithful Project Z chatterbait. Size of this thing, dude. I'm gonna go snowboarding afterwards. Oh, a... I was gonna say, those are some sweet. Did you steal Zal Dane's glasses for this well, yeah, tournament? <laughs> Pretty much, man. Oh, that's a great way to start. Uh, <laughs> Good morning on final day. I did use this swim bait to catch that 21 and a quarter inch smallmouth. I will say that. So, in the next, it, one of the next clips, so I can show that one. But yeah, she's ready right to spawn. Got all this editing done, Giant. man. Giant fish. So what's cool is I, I yeah edited this down actually because I had time on you know between Thursday and Friday as results I edited that down real quick and and sent it to Bassmaster they were cool enough to put it you know on the big screen while we're doing the award so while I'm talking I can send you another video while I'm talking they were um, playing that that big uh, the fish catch right here behind me so it's really cool to incorporate stuff like that you know what I mean video along with it there's another video of a smallie there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the next one that I just have queued up for you whenever you're ready for it. But yeah, you can see that lamprey falls off yes. Yes. her belly there. Which in a length tournament, you don't have to cry about losing that ounce of amp no. lamprey that exactly. fell off. Exactly. You don't got to worry about it. And, and I mean, it's getting get, it, get to a whole other, you know, rabbit hole. But length is actually pretty darn cool, man. When you really think about it, it's yeah. pretty cool because it, and this was on 10 killer. Yeah, it was on like 10 killer. Yeah. And it's a tr pretty true, it's actually the better test of a fish's age. You know, I do a lot of work with a bunch of fisheries biologist friends, and they confirm length is a better predictor of age. Age is the better assessment of how, of the skill it takes an angler to catch the fish, right? So therefore, it's actually the better determination of 
you know, what angler, cause you can't really target fat. I mean, you kind of can, if you find the right fish and the right stuff, but you know what I'm saying? It's actually the better predictor. And if we started bass fishing today, even in the bass butt world, I guarantee you with the technology we have and this catch photo release with the tourney X uh, app we use in length and all the expense that goes into keeping those bass alive and building a miniature aquariums in these boats and driving around and all that, that we would never even think about using weight to, to score fish. And if we did, it would be like a MLF, VPT style, you know what I mean? Right then and there, we would probably just be like, dude, we would use length. Of course, it's the best predictor of the fish's age, which is the best predictor of the skill it takes the angler to catch it. Of course, we're going to use length. That it would, that's how it'd be done. But bass fishing didn't start in the age of of this stuff. It started back in the day, and we have records that you know you're keeping up with. So anyway, what state am I from? I'm um, actually grew up in the southeast in Georgia. I lived in South Carolina for five years, uh, North Carolina for ten. Uh, went to college in Tennessee, just across the border in um, Cleveland, Tennessee, and then now I live in Northeast Ohio because my wife uh, is from up here, and I'm in the Kent area around Akron, Canton, Cleveland. You know that whole Northeast Ohio. So nice. got the free babysitting with the for the kids, and in laws are right here when I travel. Wife's got lots of help. So this is a giant smallie, and uh, it's like the third cast of that is how dangerous swim bait. And you'll just see how big. I mean, it's probably pushing six. And I lose my paddle right here. You'll notice my paddle. I don't even notice it like floats off. <laughs> That's all right. I got a motor, but I still use a paddle too. But watch this jump right here when she breaches like a whale. Just giant. Look at all that cover. It's just that's my style of fishing, man. Did you have any competition on the other kayaks up where you were? No, I did not because. I uh, rigged my setup. You know, I designed this kayak. It's a Crescent Kayak Sholey. It's really made for rivers. Drafts really shallow. Maneuvers really well. Uh, I put that Torquedo on it. I trimmed it I, and I worked on it like a NASCAR crew chief, man. I'm just out there after I found these fish. And our rules state, just so you guys listening here know, our rules state you got to stay in your kayak. You cannot get out. So I can't portage over a log. I can't portage up a rapid or a riffle. I have to stay in my kayak, so I have to get the motor or my paddle, you know, my you know, own, like, strength to, to get there and stay floating. I can't get to the point if my kayak actually hits the the bottom, then it won't uh, won't count either. So, so you can't, even can't if you there. could, like, even if you can drag yourself over with the paddle, you cannot come completely out of the water. Not anymore, or, man. Go uh, right. go Google uh, Google Gregory rules. <laughs> Type in yeah, well, Gregory well, rules. That Everyone... was, was that the... Was that the Pickwick win? Yeah, when I won a Pickwick, yeah. they, uh, they, you know, I stayed in my kayak, and obviously that's why it was. I had the GoPro footage showing I was in my kayak and never got out, but I was definitely in some shallow water, scraping up a creek because it just was low water in the fall. But there's deeper water on the other sides, and the fish utilize the whole thing. The the shad, the bait, they all move in, out, up and down, whatever. And I just was getting to the fish and uh, working hard. I mean, it's to me, it's always been this. It's no different than someone that works hard to study graphs and live scope and getting their setup you know their their transducers and their harness and, and everything the batteries where their screen is clear and bright and just dialing in that electronic setup and, and that hard work it takes to do that it's no different than the hard work i'm doing in a different way mm -hmm. like like again poche is the best example so i gotta continue to use him in the sense that sometimes he just works hard physically to get there and not just physically but with his jack plate and everything he's got going on the smaller boat you know, what it's made out of the material, everything about it, you know, he's, he's dialed it in for that. And that's kind of what I do and what I've done in, uh, in the past in, in a few events. And, uh, I, I guess, you know, at some point, someone, I, I don't even know what happened. They decided to make some rule changes. So now they call it the Gregory rules, but I'll, I'll you know, some, everyone said, dude, you got to take it as a compliment. Look at Roland Martin. And say, there's, there's, plenty of, I mean, there's plenty of Roland Martin rules and oh, things yeah. like that. Uh, like, so. but to me, it's like, dude, think about the sport of snowboarding. I mean, if people go, if they actually changed it because people were complaining, like how silly, it, you know, would that be? Like, if you, would, how would it look if the Olympic snowboarders were like, "Hey, Olympic committee, we can't do three inverted tricks, and Sean White can. He's really good. We have to like stop it at two and limit it to two. That's not the point of sports, man. The point of sports is to see how far we can push ourselves, our bodies, our mind, everything. And it's not like you're. It's not like someone's going into a farm pond that's not connected. It's all this. It's all the the, the body of water, right. right? It's all connected that the fish can freely swim in and out. So it, it's just, I don't know who knows why they change the rules, but uh, it, it doesn't matter to me. You know, I'm going to catch them 
no matter what the rules are. And at some point they actually change the rules where I can't ever fish in the places I love to fish and kayak fish and why I got into it. Then I'll just quit fishing tournaments. I mean, Oh, anyway, <laughs> that's a, the Gregor rules. Yeah, that's right. I should go hit up steel for sure. But, um, and it actually I started my own tournament trail this year. It's coming up. The first one's in Georgia. It's called the kayak adventure series. I've seen people in the comments talking about it and the kayak adventure series presented by GoPro. And it's a little bit more of a, of that style. Like think about, you know, you know, I don't know, like you're, being able, you're, you're able fisheries uh, that are like lend itself to this, right? Yeah. There's a lot of fisheries and places and, and tourism departments and in, in, in counties in the country that don't have a, a 15, 20, 75,000 acre lake. They never hear from anyone wanting to come and pr promote their fishery. So now I can go to them. Oh, you got these three lakes. So 3000 acres, 5,000, here's a 2000, whatever. And they add up to a nice amount of water plus all the rivers and creeks that, that are in that area. And we get to go there and it's, it's cool. It's sponsored by GoPro. So it's the kayak adventure series presented by GoPro. I've been sponsored by those guys for probably a decade now. And they love the idea because we're putting on our awards in these cool historic theaters that have like a marquee with the lights, you know, those little medium sized towns that have those cool, you know, historic theaters. So it's going to be fun because we're going to show clips like that. Yeah, there it is. We're going to show clips just like that, Rich, uh, that you saw and that you guys, mm -hmm. they were at the, the, Bassmaster Classic in the arena in Tulsa saw that clip for the for the anglers that come on stage. We're hopefully going to have a clip like that of them. So it's pretty cool. We got six events this year and uh, they're on some pretty epic fisheries and we're going to expose some cool new places. And I think it's just a compliment to the elite level of kayak fishing. You know, the series we already have out there today. Oh. So it's Sholy Palooza. I like that. It's going to be awesome. You guys need to come catch a shoal bass. Have you ever caught one? No. In Georgia? Uh, yeah, it, no. I've caught two over seven and uh man, dude, it's, it's, it's something else, man. Like those fish are incredible. Like you got to come catch one. Their, their scientific name is fish of the waterfalls and it's a bucket list fish. I'm, I know for most black bass, you know, fans, but Sholy Palooza is awesome. If you click on one of those, you'll see like a, a like a picture, like of a theater, for example, that you'll be in. Um, yeah, just try like the, I'll well, try another one besides Wisconsin. That one, I mean, that was a, you can see that's a theater there. That's basically what I'm talking about. Those, Theaters, but yeah, oh. there's the Keystone Theater on the Pennsylvania. We're gonna go. That's uh, where the. We'll that's where the the the, the awards. Yeah. So we have a. So we're gonna the, be uh, inside the, in the unveiling AC. of the. Because so will these mm -hmm. go dark ahead of time or? Yeah, there will be some point where the the results will go dark, and and I actually have some cool ideas on how to announce the winner to keep some suspense. We'll see how they work out, but lots of great companies in our, you know, in the fishing world are are part of this. Uh, as you can see. And um, yeah, it's going to be cool because you get food, AC, you get a comfortable seat. The anglers get a real stage, a consistent location to be at every event, uh, you know, with, with, you know, cool lighting. And uh, it's, it's going to lighten the mood a little bit to have our, our anglers come on the stage and be able to show videos. Cause you know, it's tough to be on stage and talk in front of people. It's not, it's like easy. You know what I mean? So having those videos will be, will make it fun. Cause we'll be able to laugh at things that happen and, and talk about it with the anglers, which is a little bit easier um, so that'll be fun. And then there's a two man team division. There's a big festival that goes along with it. Kids zone, bouncy houses, Toyota truck demos. Toyota is going to be there doing demos. We're going to have uh, kayak demos at some, most of the events, just a, a live music, food. I mean, drinks it, it just, you can't miss the whole family can come and have a good time. And it's really to get people into the sport um, at lower cost of entry level. You know, there's like a two man team division promotes that camaraderie and we've even got seminars from a lot of the pros at these events on our friday bass university sponsors our bass U brunch on friday we'll have at least uh three seminar speakers you can come get some some brunch with us and uh just kind of learn a little bit more before you hit the water on friday afternoon because it starts on friday afternoon from three to three to seven there's a four-hour window and then they fish again on saturday until three and then it ends saturday night so that we can party late into the night because no one's got to get driving home for work on monday Sunday is a whole just kind of recovery day so we can have a good time and, and have an after party designated after party location. It's going to be awesome. So you guys need to come get be a part of it. So are you fishing these or are you just running? No, these? no, or just this, running it. Is not a boy duck situation here. Not a boy duck situation. I'm just running it. It, I, it would be, you know, man, now that I say this, it might, might make that look bad, but I'm saying like, it would be a serious conflict of interest. If I'm the one, you know, scheduling the locations with the tourism department and setting the boundaries and, and all that stuff, it would definitely be, and, and I'm just not going to, I even, you know, in our, on the tourney X app, you even see the GPS coordinates of all the fish. 
I outsource, I'm outsourcing my tournament director side of this to uh, a company called Real Tournament Management, uh, Amanda Brandon. She actually is going to be the one doing all that. And there, and even though I'm not fishing them, I don't even want to know where the people caught the fish. And the reason is because I've got such a good relationship with Bassmaster, Hobie, KBF, all the tournament right. directors, you, Chad, You could be agent. going to these fisheries in the future gonna, and you don't want to be. Exactly. Yeah. They're going to go to this Wisconsin River. I promise you now, one of those organizations will go to this exact location. I'll give them the tourism department information because I'm not going back. We're all about adventuring to new places. We're not going back for like four or five years to any of these places. We want to explore new places around the country and expose some new, new cool fisheries because uh you know it's it's one of those things where it's it's boring you know i've i know you rich have been around a lot of elite anglers and major league fishing anglers and what's the one thing they say when the schedule comes out they are bored and tired of going to the same place they're, they're, they're they always are. most they're always the most exciting about the new venues 100 percent. it's a new game it's a new challenge and we know once you go to places over and over fish and and certain pieces of structure and things don't move. You know what I mean? It's like, they're going to be there again. So, you know, you know where, where this guy's going to be, you know, where that guy's going to be. You kind of have an idea of how it's probably going to get one. And it's kind of boring. It's, it just loses some of that, like that fun exploration. And so that's what the kayak adventure series is all about exploring these new places. And if the other series want to go, I don't even want to even ever have the coordinates because the fun for me is, is finding all this stuff, man. I mean, I, I do better at places I've gone to for the first time. When I went to the first time at Dardanelle, I won. First time on Grand Lake, I won. And only time there. Only time on King Kill, Ten Killer, I won. It's like that to me, you just look at a lake from a different perspective without history bogging you down. And it's just fun to explore and figure it out on your own. It's it's boring. I Just not the kind of person that once you know, ever gets, you know, waypoints. There's nothing wrong with that because it's legal. You know, but to me, I just love the challenge of, of figuring all that, that out myself. Yeah, it's a fun story. Yeah. I've actually been on this stretch of the Wisconsin River mm. in like do tell 1998 do tell. spring freshman first haul wig and UW stout floor trip. We kayaked or not kayak, we canoed. So like this guy over here, but yeah. there, there was plenty of uh, adult beverages consumed, but no fishing was done. <laughs> That's a cool section of river, man. That really yeah. is. It's, it's actually very hard and sandy, like not, not hard, like the hard bottom. I'm saying it's hard for boats to get there because it's so sandy. So it doesn't get as much pressure uh, from what I'm being told from the boating world, which is, that's the kind of places we want to expose for the kayak fishing world. The Susquehanna River, uh, you know, I, a lot of people already knew it was a world-class smallmouth fishery, but from a competitive tournament side, bass boats don't go there so we didn't know it right. but now kayak does and that's like the second a susquehanna tournament gets put on the schedule and it goes live for registration fills up like that i mean it's it's pretty pretty epic that place so, so you mentioned something about a uh, central minnesota tournament is that for the uh 2025 may potentially man i don't know who could say who could say <laughs> okay. i don't know it's not, we'll a, it's not on this schedule yeah it's not on this schedule it's, it's definitely a place that could be on the on our radar to go, you know, that, that we know is good. So we'll see, man, if we can, if we can figure something out, we could end up there. So it's, it's still just talks at this point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So that'd be awesome, man. I'd love to love to get up there and we'll see if we can make it happen. So, um, epic, epic smallmouth fishing up there. Yeah. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, MJ. MJ. It's cool it's, to see the kayaks go to, this is a good concept. I've also wondered, mm -hmm. Same question, not to bash BPT here, but I always wonder why when BPT's only got 40 boats on the water, why aren't they, why are yeah. they going to Toledo Bend and like these giant reservoirs? Why? I mean, yeah, I think it's way more interesting when they go to like those North Carolina lakes or when they go to Louis, like those new fresh venues. I'm much more apt to tune in and see that for sure. Absolutely. Like a, like the Chowan River, isn't the Chowan, where are they going? Isn't that it? The Chowan this year? Or the the, yeah, uh, that's the cool. next one down? Well, I'm interested in seeing that. So MJ, that the, his question I th actually is the best transition to the, the topic, the juicy, you know, little snippet that you put for the title of this show. What was it? Could kayak fishing save tournament fishing bass tournament. fishing? Yeah. And that is how he's exactly, that's how it could save it because, okay. When Tiger Woods got good at golf and he, and he just transcended everything race, he transcended like his, physical prowess over the field. He dominated, right? He's a Michael Jordan sort of figure. He transcended it. What happened to the sport of golf? It got insanely popular. So what happened to golf courses? 
crowded, bro. Like mm -hmm. so crowded, you could not get tea times. So what did they do? We have lots of land. So what do we do? Build more golf courses. Build more courses. Yeah. Because it was a pain in the butt. So what happens is prices went up to golf courses. They're like, oh, we got to go up. There's this demand. It was not fun because you're waiting for the the tee. You're waiting for people in front of you. There's no everyone's playing slow because the course is just jam packed. It's not fun. And they had to just meet that demand and build more golf courses. But what can we not do in our world? You can't just create more lakes at the whim. Oh, okay. We just, this is the, it's like the fifth reason we make a lake is for fishing, right? Probably like the fourth or fifth reason. We don't just make new lakes when it gets our sport. Our sport got popular on the bass boat side and boats became overcrowded. And it was basically like at Tiger Woods era when the golf courses were overcrowded, but yet we could not, if you could not make new golf courses, People would, the sport would cap and get top and limit out at a certain number of individuals that would do it because a certain number would leave being frustrated, which how many people have left Bass Boat World by being frustrated by so many anglers on the water and the, the tension and just the frustration. It just, ah, I don't like it. So the only way to grow the sport of bass fishing, the main way, not the only, but definitely the main way would be to expand into the other waters that these kayaks can float in other fisheries and the ways that we're doing it over there on the kayak adventure series and, and Bassmaster and Hobie and KBF are, are there go to venues like this too. They're doing a good job. But just, we have to continue to expand into the water. It's not the same bass boat water. We're so marketed to that big bass only live in Gunnersville and fork and fork's probably the worst example because they actually freaking do live there the giants of all giants but we're marketed that these are the places that have the big bass so therefore that's where we got to go but there's so many lakes like oh ivy that you never heard of until you heard of it if you know what i mean and so if we keep expanding in those we can continue to push this sport because we're still using the same line the same rods the same reels the same you know tackle boxes the same everything is the same other than we're not maybe not putting money into an outboard or, you know, we're still using the same batteries and all that stuff. But maybe outboard and the fiberglass boat itself is basically the only two things that we are not contributing to. It's basically like sand volleyball, hardcore volleyball. They're both growing right. the, the overall sport of volleyball. Dirt track racing, concrete, you know, pave racing. It's great that they're both there because the sport of racing or volleyball wouldn't be as economically, you know, impacted or whatever if we didn't have both. So it's crazy that, that if, if, Hardcore volleyball is the bass boat world. Why in the world would we over here in kayak say, you know, hey, this is sand volleyball, but why don't we put some shoes on you? And why don't we put like, you know, some make, why don't we pack the sand down really hard and make it super, super hard? And it's like, wait a second, isn't that the same thing as the hardcore volleyball? Like, that doesn't make any sense. We need to see what's different about us and go harder that direction, like push harder in that direction because that's what makes kayak special. And I think that's the direction that we can go to save, like you said, your title, you know, tournament fishing for sure. And, and you get, get to a lot of unpressured fish and cool places that just haven't had as much pressure from the big bass boat tours. So hopefully we can keep doing that. And, uh, and, I, and I think that's just an example, right? Like I think we can <clears throat> take that example and talk about virtual tournaments that can be bank fishing. We can talk about more tiny boat tournaments or small boat, right? Like uh, you, you see some right. smaller regional, boat, like there's a, like a, tiny boat nation around us there's a couple leagues in the minneapolis area that are aluminum boat you know 19 foot max or 17 foot max right but the key yeah right then don't don't go don't go to lake minnetonka with that tournament there's already plenty of tournaments at lake minnetonka go to the exactly. other nine thousand lake we have <laughs> right yeah uh, expand yeah, that sure. water um and, and that could be a cool i mean i think that you know it would be interesting to see you know Maybe that's something like, you know, we don't have really have like national team tournaments. We don't really have like, you know, that mid-sized boat type, you know, like right. kind of like your racing analogy, right? There's there's different leagues and classes of races in the in the vehicle you use. Maybe that's another avenue to grow things to have more of a, you know, a capped like, you know, right? Uh, there, there's reasons they have, you know, mods and in different levels of racing because yeah. that caps. The, the amount of horsepower and the resources, you know, you're not, you know, whatever, a Formula One or a NASCAR car probably costs a million dollars. But, you know, you could, you know, the dirt tracks, hopefully you can probably slap something down for a few tens of thousands of dollars. Right. Yeah, so exactly. maybe that's kind of how this this grows and how we leverage more of our resources beyond the, yeah. the mega reservoirs. Absolutely. You know, the thing that's funny is that I think if, if the electronics company, if anyone out there thinks that, well, let's just 
if it's all won by this, then it's going to make everyone get it. The problem that they're failing to understand, if that's their mentality, I'm not saying it is, but if that's what it is, that's just keeping the same exact number of people in the sport and saying, now spend more money. But it's making it harder for new people to get in it. But if you allow the, if the leagues allow the rule set, like we talked about opening up some other shallow water, you know, tactics and things that, that were outlawed to help push it that other way, then at least like it lets someone get in the game. In the kayak world, mm-hmm. you know, you could, if the rule set and the format's right, you know, somebody could go out there with a three, four hundred dollar, five hundred dollar cheapo and, and have a shot. And at least they're in the game. But if it's so clear and obvious that you're not going to win without this this boat, this expensive technology and all this stuff, they're never getting in the game. And what's here's what's crazy is if you can just get them in the game. So the hardest way, the hardest point to get any any customer, you know, into your stadium or into your store is that first step. Once you get them in there, they're going to buy the hot dog, the beer, everything else. The hardest is to get them just in the building, in the stadium. Let's get them to buy a dang ticket. And once you do that, you got them. It's making it harder for those people to get in because once they get in and they start and they fall in love with it, they they're like, oh, I think one of those pedal drive kayaks. Oh, those those graphs. I think that's cool technology. They start the next thing you know, a year later, if they got a cheap three four hundred dollar kayak because that's all they could afford, but yet you could still potentially win in those. You made it possible with your rule sets and the format. The next thing you know, they're buying the graph. They're buying the pedal drive a year or two later when they get money. You know, maybe they just got out of college, didn't have it, and now they're in the game and you're growing the overall number of people instead of just saying cutting them off and saying. You have no shot. Just just give up now. Unless you have this technology, you're out. So that's that's where I feel like it's hurting us, actually, is it's just people are just turned off by it. They're just so turned off because they just know they're not dumb. People aren't dumb. They know they have no shot in the, the big bass boat world now without that technology. And, and they're right. If you look at all the standings, you can't use an outlier like John Cox and say, oh, every once in a while, John Cox, bro, look at the whole leaderboard and look who's in the top and what they're doing. He's an outlier. Well, you know? I do think there is potential through scheduling. Mm-hmm. That, that's probably the most, right? Yeah. Like if we had a tournament series, that was like the Sabine, the Potomac, lacrosse, lacrosse. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Uh, Minnetonka even, James, right? Where you have maybe, a, a James. dominant milfoil grass filled Northern Lake with lar- without smallmouth uh, mm-hmm. or, or limited smallmouth. I think, you know, tidal fisheries, rivers, those are the things that can really like not saying yeah. the fish won't be caught, but I don't think those they would You're be right. dominated by the, right. The schedule is, is a big part of it, but it's scaring me. What's scaring me is when we went down to Okeechobee, did we realize did we think that Revet it was going to be one using that technology then? No. We were like, oh, vegetation, we can punch. Oh, there's all kinds of stuff you can do where you and you need to do in in, in Florida to win, possibly win, and maybe this won't work. And then this year, Scott Martin, he's he's at the open, he's uh Forward facing sonar in perspective mode and, and they're on bed and he's bed fishing them without. Yeah, I'm not saying uh, that it, it can't so, win and it won't play, right, but it, right. it definitely it helps. It, it will help for it, sure. It definitely limits it to some degree. Um, it, it does. It 100% sure. does. But that's what scares me is I thought once the spawn came, they get shallow. Maybe these guys, it's not going to play as much. And then we're finding, and here's my thing I know that all bass don't, you know, they all spawn at different times. They all spawn within like, you know, usually it's a, even a couple months. So the fish that they're chasing out there in fork and the timber suspended, the bait's still out there. And the mo- like if they if it takes them a female, she goes in, she spawns for a few days, whatever. She's there, she's back out, bro. Like you're always gonna have fish out there more than you realize. They don't like all go to the bank at the same time, and it's just this, you know, it's still gonna play. This thing, same thing's gonna happen. It's still gonna play out there all the time even during the spawn you're still gonna be able to find them somewhere out there like that because they already they haven't spawned yet or they've already done spawning and are back out on whatever they you know want to ambush bait by you know the timber or whatever that so it's it's wild to see what that's done to the sport but anyway yeah a lot of good comments here too should we address trolling motors on chat i mean i think that's pretty readily except i mean is there so here's a question so yeah kind of putting on this um is i guess what is, is there any like uh a, a, a group of kayakers that are like anti i mean is there like a yeah electric oh, yeah. motors are ruining kayaks and it's it's ruining 100%. the sport of kayak fishing 100 percent, dude and there there's that out there there's a lot of local clubs uh that don't allow motors you know and uh there are and that's 
that's fine. That's that's you know that's the way it started. It was wasn't a motorized thing. Uh, but but now the thing about motors, okay, I I feel like with the rule set of the kayak adventure series, for example, allowing to access at any public access on that body of water and any water that's connected, kind of thing, you could put in at the bridge. You know, you can do that kind of stuff where a motor and the battery and all that setup, it's kind of hard to do that. It's not like a boat launch. So it balances out that you could still win with this cheapo three, $400 sneak it into a little cool spot like that. Now you got to compete against the other anglers who are also doing that and do not have a motor and a battery, but it kind of balances it out. But then the, um, but in the, in the, the elitist level of kayak fishing with the designated launches, the way the rules are, you, that's kind of an example of what we were talking about. You kind of, gotta have a motor man it's 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 not saying it can't be one without it but you almost you know you look at all the results it's pretty much with the motor these days so there are le leagues out there that don't use it but they're mostly local clubs the national level but here's the cool thing about the motor it you got it, it brings in from the business perspective this whole world of you know sport fishing right bass fishing it brings in your motor companies, which have a lot of money. It brings in your battery companies, which have a lot of money. And like I said, if you keep your rules the right way and Bassmaster at least will let me go as far as I can get, you know, my motor as far as I want to go, um, then it, it you know, it, it kind of works. It kind of works and helps everybody. You know what I mean? I can still fish the way I want to fish. And, you know, they're expensive. Like you said, it's not soccer. It's not just a, a paddle on a kayak, something cheap, three, $400. But, you know, you can still get a little troll mode, old used Minn Kota or whatever, and just put it up on the, you know, rig something. There's lots of companies out there that make, you know, a, a, a way for you to mount it just on the, uh, the transom and in the stern of your kayak. And you can put an extender handle on it and just use that. You don't have to have a two $2,500 Torquedo or $3,000, whatever it is, uh, you know, or a, a, the highest, most expensive motor guide or whatever. You don't have to, obviously it, you will go faster with it and, and, time is is essentially casting and and money potentially in tournaments so it's definitely nice to go faster at least as fast as you, you know and i guess within kayaking is there is there much talk about electronics and limits oh, and yeah. things like that or dude we're, we're gonna be if whatever the elites do we will be behind about a year or two so if this year as we're seeing is just dominating in the kayak world it will get harder and harder for people like me to probably win. I mean, it really will just because more and more uh, people will get the technology on their kayaks and get proficient with it. That's the key. You got to take time to get proficient with it. Well, now we're seeing all the elites there. There's a good chunk of them now. I don't know what you would guesstimate, but probably I would say, man, like 60%, 67. Would you say 60 or 70? Like, Obviously, they all have it. Pretty much all of them have it. But like, I'd say sixty or seventy or seventy really, really are pretty darn good with it. There's obviously ones that are better. Like, there's this right. top level percent that are like really dialed. But they got it to the point where they can, they can use it, understand it. Kayak, we don't have quite as many. That, and it's a little harder in a kayak to do it. You can't chase these open water fish on like Champlain roaming, chasing owl wives is easy. The sing these singles, but and it's a little harder. We still have obviously spot lock and stuff like that on the troll motors. The bow mounted motors, uh, torpedo doesn't have that, the stern mounted stuff, but I just think it's going to get, it's, it's going to get harder and harder. More and more people will get it. They're going to get better at it. And, uh, the beauty for us is we can at least cherry pick our events. You know, this isn't the elite series. I got to fish all nine of these things, wherever, no, wherever they go, I got to go. I can cherry pick the ones that fit my style, you know, between the Hobie, the KDF, Bassmaster, whatever. I can pick my style. Elites can't do that. So I can at least still hang in there by, by that, you know, sure. but yeah, it's, it's getting nuts, man. People are putting two and three graphs on there, all <laughs> kinds of setups. You know, we got power pole micro anchors. We got, it's, it's, it looks like the game board game mousetrap, the old board game, just stuff everywhere. It's the opposite of what I like to do. Rod sticking so, up everywhere. Right. I would say the, uh, <clears throat> kind of the, the, I don't know if you call it the norm or the upper, whatever, like an elite level, bass boat is probably 100 to 120 on average rate yep. what would you say like the top guys like what does that look like is that like five grand ten grand no, 20 grand it's, for like, a it's like 15 maybe 10 20 15. 15 20 i mean because I mean, you, it really depends i mean if you <laughs> right uh, it kind of caps out until you start adding a bunch of screens right but uh, yep. yeah exactly it's like but a base 
what's like a base kayak like top of the line i mean like you get pretty pretty good what, one like the, the crest is kind of a big one like crescent kayak solely i'm in is like 1600 retail and you can start adding the motor it's like around 3000 you know for a torpedo like that and then you start you know if you threw in like some so a graph you know and then the live scope you add that up you put in a power pole you got you know it's it's starts to add up but that's a 1500 16 which is not expensive compared to what a lot of them these days they're, they're many boats you know they're not really i mean we call them kayaks but they're just many boats you stand in them you can walk to the front um you know that like a some of them are four and five thousand dollars that's like the price of the kayak they they have pedal drives and and you know things that definitely cost a lot to engineer so you know you're paying for all that and and four or five thousand dollars brand new on the show floor now you start adding two graphs because that's a bigger more uh lake focused kayak i think gene jensen i've seen had like three on his fluke master you know and live scope power poles geez louise you start to uh, motors starts the batteries the cost of lithiums you know to get two two of them in there 100 amp hours like good lord like this thing's pushing 20 grand at that point so speaking of which I didn't mention this earlier, but Hell of Ass Live is presented by Arsenal Fishing and boosted by Powerhouse Lithium. In case I didn't mention that earlier for everybody. <laughs> um, <laughs> I thought you, I thought you were going to say, speaking of which, twenty grand that you know, yeah, yeah. I won, I won twenty five. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, I have no. won twenty five grand. I wanted to bring that up twenty five five. I want this is pretty cool though. So just to so give a little positivity, I, I'm I like to stay positive with the sport. And at the Bassmaster Classic, I was looking at the uh, the results, the payouts from the elites, right? The classic and i thought it was pretty cool man it, very cool that if you take everybody kayak anglers bass boat anglers in that event i was number five in earnings on the weekend i mean that's crazy just above lee Livesey in fifth place in the classic i would have been fifth or right after fourth that's pretty darn cool that you can still you know and we have had payouts in kayak fishing that that are, were more we've had a hundred thousand dollar winner we've had seventy five thousand dollar winners KBF National Championship used to have six, seven hundred people going to that thing. Hobie Bass Open Series Tournament of Champions, I think, pays thirty, paid 25, 30, 40, something like that. Bassmaster uh, pays really well, obviously, but we also get the the media exposure and everything else that comes sure. with with what they do, which is a huge overhead and expense and the brand that they built over the years. So there's a lot of value in that. But you could definitely, you know, for a four hundred dollar entry yeah. fee in most of the tournaments, the regular season Bassmaster events are like two fifty. So you also got to think about what you put into it. You know, did I, we didn't burn gas all in practice like they did and all during the tournament. Like it's much, much lower cost in terms of what you kind of are investing in your entry fee and your travel and all that compared to them. You know, I'm, I'm putting my kayak in the back of my truck, not even a trailer. So I'm getting good gas mileage on that Toyota Tacoma and rock and rolling. And so for $400 to, for that event to pull, pull that off, it's, it's pretty awesome, man. And, uh, you know, Anybody, anybody out there could do it. You guys get in the sport and, yeah. and you could end up on that classic stage for a little bit lower price point than um, the boater side. So to kind of pay off again on the, the, the title of this stream, <clears throat> is there anything, so obviously most of these terms you can follow along in apps and websites to see mm -hmm. the inches and the leaderboards and stuff. Is there any movement or what are, is there any leagues going anywhere to actually do live on the water coverage or what, what is that looking like? Live is going to, is always going to be challenging and tough. The places we go to the cell signal, um, and then just getting to some of the anglers. Now, if you're on the lake, no problem, right? Like Mark, Mark Cisneros, the cameraman for the Bassmaster kayak series. He's usually on a boat driving around, getting people in the lake. You could go live. You could do that, but you're always going to miss some of the action to anglers that are far enough away. Like me, for example, which is why I, film everything with my GoPro. It, it saved my butt, you know, at Pickwick when, when there was that protest and disqualification, and then I was able to prove, prove to them and show them the footage. And then they were like, Oh, okay. So you were within the rules. Thanks. Thank, thanks to having that GoPro running. Right. So the, I think what's really more like going to happen is kind of what we're doing. And, and Steve Owens at Bassmaster kayak series, the tournament director, you know, doing such a great job and they're starting to incorporate some of the stuff as well, where they're putting the pictures and, and even like this video we posted on this, we put on the screen of the classic that I submitted to them. So I'm thinking and hoping more and more people are going to submit videos now, short little, it's just a 30 second, one clip, no edit needed, just one on, you know, just trim it down to that minute of that fish catch, that 30 seconds and more of that. So the coverage might be more like at the awards. You might have some stuff like that happen where it's not so much live, but, uh, 
but then there's definitely been some that, that you know you can get a drone up on people and stuff like that but it's just harder from a you know a, a production company standpoint it's very it's going to be harder to cover those events in that way so it's going to going to have to be when technology gets where gopros and stuff can get enough power and cell signal to stream live without interruption to where you can a producer can be back there changing all the cameras to the anglers and you might have to have people out there supporting the anglers with those GoPros, but at least they're not having to film and, and they could get into a, a a jet boat or a kayak that has a torpedo like this and just kind of keep up with that angler and make sure his GoPros are on and powered and there's no problems. It could happen with a smaller field. You get if you cut or it down just get to the somebody out there with a cell phone walking down the bank and the little creeks that you find yourself in, they can just follow along. Yeah. Shooting point. <laughs> yeah, see if they get a uh, see how the, the local landowners feel about that. <laughs> Some of these places yeah. I go. Uh, have you, was this your first classic expo you went to, or have you been to some in the past? Oh, no, I've been to most all of them. I mean, since okay. probably, oh, God, no, who knows, man? Um, who knows how I've been to a lot of them, but the, um, you know, so, so mo- you got you have a few more minutes? Yeah, man, let's talk about it. So let's take a 30-second break, and then we'll come back, and let's talk about the classic and the expo. Let's do it. Are you ready to reel in your next home purchase or refinance? Supreme Lending's Dream Team can help guide you through the entire mortgage process from pre-qualification to closing. We have a wide variety of home loan programs in our tackle box, including down payment assistance and first-time homebuyer options. You can ask Hella Bass. He trusted us to help finance his home. Contact the Dream Team today by searching Supreme Lending Dream Team or click the link below in the description or scan the QR code on your screen. All right. Thanks to the Dream Team. We're back. If you need to invest that those winnings and get yourself another house down south, you know, the Dream, dream team, team can help you out. I'm calling the, I'm calling the Dream Team. <laughs> No doubt about it. I thought about that. Who didn't want he's the actually, dream team? He's actually a guy that's in my bass club. He's a tournament bass angler. So he's mm. he's one of us that's got that 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 sickness and addiction. So yeah, nice. So yeah. So you've been to several. Sounds like I've only been this is oh, only yeah. my second one that I've actually went to. I've obviously have followed many along in the past, but uh, I guess maybe just since you've been to many, what are your thoughts on let's just start with the expo in Tulsa? I mean, it's it's one of the coolest things. It really is. I mean to to see all of the pros that you watch on TV and you follow on social media or YouTube, I mean, all there in one place. It, it's, I know so many people have said that, said this, like, it's just like, they're just like a kid in a candy store. They just can't believe like that Kevin Van Dam's right there or Mike Iconelli is right there. Or it, it just be like hanging out with all your favorite NBA or NFL players, whatever you're also a fan of golfers. And, and it's, it's just pretty cool. And then, you know, hopefully you realize and they, they, that, they're just all, most all of them are pretty darn down to earth, cool dudes and, you know, willing to do whatever and, and sign whatever you want and, and talk to you about whatever they can. And that most of them are very good for the sport and great representation. So it's, it's, it's a fun place. And then you get to see all the manufacturers and all the baits and all the, all the stuff and, and get, you know, save a lot of money, buy some stuff on sale. It's, it's just, you could, I could have been there for another two days. Just, I didn't get to see everyone I wanted to see, you know, I mean, but. It was fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I guess, how do you think uh, this one stacks up to some? I mean, like, is this your, your, uh, have you been to Tulsa before for classics? I have been to Tulsa for a classic. So do you feel like this expo stacked up to previous expos as far as traffic? I don't know if I could, it was a long time ago we were at Tulsa. I mean, that was like, I don't even remember the expo back then, honestly, but I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, there was definitely in the sport, we've seen a, a pullback from some brands, ICAST right. at classic expo, but I feel like it was pretty, pretty, pretty big. Like most everyone was there that I would expect to see there, yeah, you know, um, was a noticeable, right? Like that's true. That's true. Fishing. I didn't, yeah. I didn't really even think about that. I didn't see. They must have spent that. all their money at the uh, the event in NASA. Um, yeah, and didn't have money for the classic. <laughs> yeah, must not. I don't know. I mean, Bailey spent all their money in Houston, and they yeah, didn't Bailey have any money to go there. Yeah, that's that. right. The uh, yeah, I remember they did that thing. Alex Rudd talked about that a lot. That symposium, um, or whatever that was. Otherwise, yeah, there's. I mean, I, I thought it was good. Like, 
Knoxville was definitely way busier from a foot traffic. I mean, like there were times mm-hmm. I'm not a person that like gets freaked out by crowds. Like I don't have a problem going to football games and stuff, but like last year in Knoxville, there's a couple times I was like, as we sure the oh, fire yeah. marshals okay with this? Cause it was like, right. Yeah, it really was. Um, Tulsa was very steady, but it wasn't overwhelming. I mean, yeah, it, I'd say so. <laughs> Like, I there wasn't was there on Sunday. You went, there was people moving, always mm-hmm. running into people, but you didn't feel like, man, I'm about to get tramped, tramped, you know, or just like ran over. Um, or COVID. That's a big COVID spreader, like that yeah. one year, uh, for sure. But I mean, it was just cool, though, man, like, seeing everyone there hanging out. It's where us in the industry who all know each other, you know, a lot of the, you know, friends that you have and, and I have in the industry, it's really one of the coolest things is we see each other a couple of times a year. You know what I mean? It's, it's ICAST, it's a classic. And then maybe a few times in between um, that we're actually all there together. Obviously the elites see each other every, every tournament and stuff like that. But uh, the main effect, so it's, it's just cool, man. I love it. It's just like a big family. You know, we, we're all in this, no one makes a ton of money. I mean, there's people that definitely make really good livings, but they are like the outliers kind of like, look at your major league baseball players. Yeah. They all make most of them make a ton of money, but there's a lot of dudes in the minor leagues that are not, they're pros that are not, you know, crushing like that uh, for sure. There's more of them than, the, than there are the others, quite frankly. So uh, we're all in this because we love it. And when you get to see people that are working in a sport that they're passionate about and they love it, I mean, it, it just, it just feels like a big family and it, and it is. So it's a fun time. Yeah, it was cool. I got to meet several people like Trevor, wow, Trevor. who also met you. Um, yeah, <laughs> a lot of people that we tack with here on, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I've met Lauren locally, but last time I ran into him at the bull ramp, my mouse, I didn't have any of my stickers. So I had stickers this time. So I was able to to hook up uh, Lauren with some stickers. Nice. Um, so yeah, there was a lot of people, uh, Sean Lai. Uh, oh yeah. Sean's on everything dude. in the comments. Yeah, He's I got to meet him finally this year. I'm sure I'm, I shouldn't name names because I'm missing people. Uh, Travis Drunkwood. Stearman, you see Drunkwood? Uh, <laughs> Drunkwood's on everything too. Yeah, I ran into Drunkwood. Actually, I sublet uh, 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 Airbnb from Drunkwood last year in um, uh, uh, Knoxville. But uh, That's funny. Yeah, it was great. I ran into Ken Duke, Scalish. Uh, at, yep. you know, so, so many. Now, what's cool, if you guys go check out my Instagram, uh, it's Drew Gregory Fishing. I mean, I got pictures with... I don't know, man, t- like probably 25 elites and BPT guys that are, it's pretty cool. Cause the more it is like, the more you kind of win in kayak, the more you kind of become a name. That's not even so much just, it's like Christine Fisher. You know what I mean? Like everyone knows Christine Fisher. It doesn't even, she was there the bass boat world, <laughs> kayak world. She's, she's everywhere and she's awesome. And, and freaking good angler too. Uh, people probably underestimate really how good she is. Cause you know, when you talk to a bass angler that, like when you know how to catch them and you talk to someone who knows how to catch them, you instantly know that they're legit. Like they're, you can't fake, you know, you can't fake it. So anyway, seeing her there and everyone um, it's, it's, I forgot where I was going. What was I saying? I was talking about, uh, Oh, the pictures I got with all those pros. It's cool because it's no longer like, who are you with this show? It's like, I coming up, up to me and being like, bro, like, dude, congrats, man. Like it, it's kind of cool that, we're starting to kind of push and, and become a little bit more known. And hopefully I can, you know, do whatever good I can with these titles and kind of get it that way because we're all just one big, like we talked about earlier, we're all one big bass fishing family. And it's like saying volleyball and hardcore, like we said. So it's really cool. And I've got pictures. They were all so nice. I mean, some of them didn't have the best day. They come back in the media room after they weighed in on day one, drew cook, dude's got a five pound, uh, or five minute late penalty loses five pounds at 18 something would have been right in the hunt sees me in the hallway i don't and i actually don't even know drew cook i don't know i don't think he knows who i am but he saw the trophy he's like you know just he got out of the bathroom he's walking back in the hallway he's like do you win what is that man you want it i told him and he was just as happy as could be for me did you would never known that he had a five minute late penalty and he just get, had the biggest smile i said let's get a picture he said no absolutely he came the biggest smile and they're whipped, man. That's a, you know, obviously the toughest experience uh, or event for them in terms of like just long days, right? A lot, of, lot going on, but it's just so cool. You guys can go see those pictures with those guys. And uh, hopefully we're just kind of merging this sport into, into one a little bit more just understanding and, and respect. It's about a little bit about respect to me. I feel like some people think we kayak fish because we don't have the money to fish out of a bass boat, which is not the case at all. Cause I used to have a bass boat in, in college and sold it and, 
fell in love and I choose kayak fishing. Russ Snyder's chooses kayak fishing. That dude could go hammer them. And, and, you know, trust me, the guys in the elite series, I don't think anyone would be thrilled about seeing that guy out there on the elite series. He knows how to catch them. And there's, there's a lot of other names I can mention in the kayak world that are that kind of super high level. Now we don't go as deep as a field, but anyway, really cool to be at that expo and have all the elites and those guys around and, and the fans can see them and, and just how they treated me with such respect. So we're, we're doing good things in the sport and, and definitely guys go check out that expo. Um, man, it's just, you don't want to miss that event every year. Yeah. New uh, products. Uh, yeah. Is there anything that caught your eye or were you, were you looking at stuff? Like I didn't have a lot of time to look, honestly, I don't know if I heard about a bunch of new releases at the classic. Did you hear of much? Yeah. I don't think I, I mean, heard there was, much. I don't know about new, new products new stuff. from Power Pole. Like I saw like, somebody <laughs> that had some like new like turret thing with a foot pedal. <laughs> We're not going to go into that. <laughs> um, Did you see the new thing from Power Pole? I, I, I work with Power Pole and they had yeah, a new single pump power a single pole. pump thing that's lighter. I saw um, that. I mean, there were some limited edition colors of like missile baits, baits, yeah. magic worms, you know, limited edition KGB shad, you know, uh, Chad mm -hmm. shads, you know, spro colors, yeah. like. I mean, there was like some, you know, Mega Bass had their their jerk bait color, you know, things like that. But I don't know that there was anything like any big drop where like, hey, there's this new bait from Six Sense or there's this bait. Uh, at least not that I was really. Um, Core Tackle had some of their new stuff there. I mean, there was kind of some, but no like big stuff yeah. that I can really think of. It wasn't like any big like unveilings. Um, right. I don't think so either. You guys in the comments can mention something if you if you saw something. But I didn't see anything. I mean, I did get the uh, couple things I got. So I picked up uh, Matt Steffen, core tackle. Yeah. Stop and talk to him. Uh, he's got a, a swim jig here that's built on his Tush swim bait head that I thought was kind of cool. A little bit oh, something sweet. unique. Yeah, I you see probably that. don't throw swim jigs up where you fish. That's probably not a thing that you do. You know, I mean, you being, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Def but uh, so I mean, it's got a Def really tiny head. Jig. Yeah, but it's because got the Yep. It's got the weights back there. And then it's just got a single wire weed guard on it. Um, I love that, man. I love hidden weight. Uh, that's what the spinnerbait. Yeah. I like so, to use some spinnerbait. Kind of I love a good swim jig. Uh, so it kind of blends the tush swim jig with kind of the the thin light wire upper Mississippi River kind of northern swim jig. Right. Uh, so I'm kind of interested to try that. And this is in his Goldilocks color. So um, nice. Oh, that's that's sweet. I like that. You know, you know what's cool about the hidden weight stuff when you when you kill them, they usually fall like completely horizontal still. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like natural. They don't, especially yeah. like on a spinner bait, they don't just start fluttering down. They actually is, and it falls naturally, like normally in that same position, which is pretty cool. So and according to what he said is that if you like to fish a paddle tail style, it's going to allow that bait to roll more versus all that on the nose. It keeps it more right. keeled or even so that your swim bait can do more swim bait things. Um, I can then I grab buy that. I, I like a good color. good swim jig. So, oh, that's yeah. a great color. That's a great yeah. bluegill pattern there. So, grabbed a couple of those. I like that. Let's see what else. Yeah, we did have to go to Omnia. They were uh, giving away everybody's favorite, uh, yeah, Wild River jerky. They were, yeah, they were all over it. I assume that uh, jerky transcends into the kayak world as a good vessel oh, yeah. snack. It is a good vessel snack. I, I actually just. You know, maybe I should hit up Campbell's or Progresso, but I actually just pop a can of Campbell's clam chowder, chicken corn chowder, and just go, just chug it as I'm moving. Just hearty. It's it's good. Old clam chowder. It, you know, it's 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 not always cold. It's kind of like the temperature of whatever it is outside. It could be warm. Could be 95 degrees. So it's it doesn't hmm, matter. It's so hungry. It doesn't even matter if it's cold. It tastes so good. Like you just got to try it, and you're filled up, and you got plenty of energy. Um, and it's quick and hardy. Yeah, Stro did have their reels. That's true. I did look at those. Oh, they didn't seem okay. like anything okay. super. I mean, they is were it reels. bait casting or spinning or both? They had both. Ah, I'll have to um, check out where we up, ran into each other with and... pick that uh, drew. I did grab one of these Mojo mm -hmm. Hypno Toad frogs, which is John Sukup's frog. Let I assume you throw out. some frogs up in those creeks from every now and then, but he had Sometimes, these for like yeah. five bucks. Oh, Seems wow. pretty legit, pretty soft. Got a good hook in it, like five bucks. I mean, is it way different than a spro? No, for five bucks, I'm gonna will to give it a you know, give it a whirl and see what I think. Yeah, looks like it's got kind of like a little 
kind of I don't know, like an epoxy to hold the hook place in there mm-hmm. to kind of seal that up. I don't know. We'll see. Do it. Silence. Yeah, I mean... uh, we'll find out whether the uh, the weight holds in place, but it passed, and it's actually got, if you can see that, there's like a micro holes in the back of it, which in theory, as it compresses, should have not get bogged down as far as like, you know, some frogs, yeah. if the, when you squeeze them, right, the air gets trapped. This should make them collapse a little early, easier. That's cool. So, I don't know it's worth worth a look. And then worth see a what shot. Else I didn't grab too much. I did get the. Uh, this was free. That was in my Bass Nation thing, but uh, I did get the the. I, I've been kind of a fan of the Magic Worms late in the year. Um, so they had a Sooner Secret color, which is kind of a, a kind of a. I mean, they're they're, like they're, a... they're 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 right. They're a co-op with Rubble Worms, so it's kind of like a. Yep chartreuse oh, wow. blue bold bluegill almost like a different kind of take on bold bluegill is how i'd subscribe yeah subscribe it. so but i feel like you know john cruz seems to do things the right way when it comes to the collab so he does I don't yeah. mind like supporting him a little bit and and I've, check great check guy that out. yeah he stopped me he stopped me and you know sometimes i'm like hey let's you know i know john uh he's always been super nice to me known him for a while now and uh yeah he's one of the guys that you know i stopped him and he said yeah, let's get a picture and use my phone he's like no i want, want one with my phone too and he you know posted a, yeah. a little carousel picture with myself and they just super super good guy and uh definitely love seeing people support folks like him that I just did, have done so much I in did the industry see the evergreen combat rat i did see that hmm. i got my fish boat docks hat that. for those people that love fishing boat docks, oh I got yeah that. <laughs> so I saw uh, Watson walking around with those boxes, of those hats. So, it's and then funny. Uh, this is kind of my my splurge souvenir. Got a Tato seven inch Eon glide. Yep. Do you uh, do you dabble with the glides when you're up there messing around, or is I that mean, something you? Uh... I don't. I don't. I, I don't a lot. I mean, I have you know I've sponsored by Thirteen Fishing for a while. They made some, and I, I just. Not real. I mean, they'll eat it, and I shoal yeah, bass would smash that stuff. They eat it, but I just already know what they eat, and they don't. They've not stopped eating the stuff I throw. It's like right. I feel like that we get the we like the bass boat, uh, the bass fishing industry gets so saturated with so many new techniques and mm-hmm. and new things that the average angler never has the amount of days on the water that an elite angler has to actually really perfect and refine every one of the techniques and know when to use that technique properly so we kind of i just am sort of like i need need some baits that work on the surface i need some baits i know will catch them in the mid-range and then some that'll catch them on the bottom and then that's i just get better and better and better at those baits and focus my time on that and until somebody out fishes me with something else some new thing that's uh, uh whatever and again guys i fish in these i try to find fish in remote places and in the water clarity uh you know the what the right moderate current the right level of current whatever all these places where my styles will work the power fishing buzz bait spinner bait chatter bait swim bait stuff like that will work so until somebody out fishes me with a nico rig or whatever in these same places i'm going i'm never gonna worry about learning you know all that stuff you know i don't really throw a drop shot don't really throw wacky rig don't and they'll catch them but i'm making five times as many casts and power fishing and uh, right. catching them just fine, so it's kind of like, but, but yeah, I mean, I the think, glide is it's a right. fun way to catch them. A glide bait where you're going is not the meta; it's not the most effective tool, right? You're yeah, it's not, a bigger it's rod than you need to carry for the rest of them. You got giant treble hooks that you know. Right, I, I saw you had like your little spread of rods out. Like, yeah, you got a seven inch glide with two watt trebles, trebles hanging there. out there. That's just uh, like tre- yeah. yeah. I avoid trouble, right. You're right. I avoid treble hooks whenever I can. I'm I'm a big single hook kind of guy jig spinner bait chatter bait like i said swim bait stuff like that and that's what i prefer and then they come in the boat they get in the boat you hook them you know properly you get a strong hook set usually they're they're in the boat and the glide is a is like you're saying it's just there's a lot of wood up there in these places a lot of crazy just carnage up there in those rivers and just structure it um so you never know uh you know throwing trouble hooks is, is like, tricky because i like to throw made, cast way up in frog, there swim yeah, jigs frogs. Some spinner baits, spinner baits, because I like to throw baits actually on the bank sometimes and, and over the logs and then roll them right in naturally or on the bank. And 
it, this, you know, treble hook baits just the one treble hook bait I use probably the most pro is, is like a chopo. I will use that a good bit and it's got trebles, but you're, you can really cast that very, very accurately because of its profile and the way it is. And you can dial it in and get it, you know, right where you want it typically and away from that stuff and work it around. But once you hook a fish in that stuff, if they go down and they got those treble hooks and they're in their mouth and they go by a log, it can get caught. So, um, I just kind of have, you know, my, my style and just stick with it until it stops working and seems to be working still. So I guess I'll yeah. not change it anytime soon. Yeah, spinner bait spinner voice bait for choice. me, you know, I love the, uh, the Z man sling blades always been a, a good spinner bait. I actually bend it down. I may have one laying around. I usually have baits here, but I may have taken it, but, um, I think I did take them, but, uh, it, that's a cool bait. Uh, I changed a modify, you know, just so you guys know, every, every spinner bait company, man, they want them to get to your, to the shelves as inexpensively as possible so they can get the sale. So what does that mean? That means you need to like understand the things to change. So I change out the blades on that, uh, sling blades, spinner bait. I don't have to, but for certain situations like this 10 killer tournament, I used a wide willow leaf blade, one that was fluted. And I would use another one that was painted chartreuse to go with my chartreuse and white bait. And I added a second skirt to bulk it up and add, allow like more water displacement to go around that bait. I added a Z man minnows trailer with that, uh, what is pearl and chartreuse tail. So this thing, like your typical Oklahoma, like bright painted blade, like, you know, spinner bait. And then I also bend it down. I don't know if anybody else does this. And uh, there's a video I have showing how I do it, but I bend the blades down where they're closer to the hook. So have you ever seen like a mini me from spot sticker baits? I use that one. Some too. that hidden weight bait, the, the, the wires bent down where those blades are closer to the hook. Cause the wider it is, the more it wants to rise and I'm in a river. I need it to fall. So I got to usually use heavier than most people. I hardly ever go like, I really don't ever fish lighter than a half ounce. I'm usually throwing half three quarters ounce, like spinner baits in the river to get them in the current. So when you bend that down, it actually lets the bait go deeper and, and not rise as much. So I do a lot of modifications to it, but they give you the platform to do that uh, right from the shelf at a good price point. So the sling blades is good, but I do also talk about the, um, uh, <laughs> don't need to talk about the wide willow blades. Yeah. It's a pretty cool. It's a pretty cool combo there. It's like, it's like a Indiana in a way, but, and I just right. I love the profile and how, what it does to the bait, but yeah. Um, that's the bait. I, like I said, that mini me is a good bait too, for a light wire, um, real fast burning it type of bait in Susquehanna river places like that. When you're just ripping it, just think about Lanier for spotted bass or some fishery, sure. the Champlain, wherever you can just launch a, a bait way out there. It's got the hidden weight, and just burn it, um, as fast as possible. So, there's Sean. What's up, man? Yeah, we, just, we talked about him and he, he appeared just like that. I know. He just hurt his ears were burning. But yeah, man, it's, it's been uh, so a couple of people are asking. Uh, I, yeah. So, have they announced the classic venue yet? They have not. I mean, we will find out, okay. I think, fairly soon. They're going to, I'm sure they're in talks with some different lakes, tourism departments. Right. So, people are thinking, did, like, it's on Ray Roberts. We did Possum Kingdom last time. We were classic say, guys yeah. were on Ray. They're probably not doing that one because we went there last time and we've had for two years in a row this year in April and uh, last year we've gone there for a regular season event. So I think, I think people are predicting it's probably not going to be that one. Uh, people are thinking Texoma, maybe some people think could be the Trinity river lakes. I think there's like Eagle mountain and Lake worth maybe is what they are. And the Trinity river that they're kind of like, because with us, you could combine a couple lakes, you know, cause we have all, you know, designated launches, but you know, all over the lakes we fish. So it could be, and there we've had tournaments before in the, in the kayak bass fishing world, big tournaments like Shreveport where you could fish, you know, Lake Caddo or Lake Bissano or like, you know, like there's five lakes and bounds or the red river. So we've set the precedent that that's okay in our sport. So that could work. You could also have some people thought Lake fork. I think that could be maybe a little too far away from over there on that side on Fort worth, but they like to keep us usually within an hour, an hour and 15, hour and a half at the most. Texoma is the one that's probably got the best odds for it to be, but we will see. We'll see what happens. There could be okay. Lake Athens or Lake Palestine. I don't know. Those are know how far those are. They could be within shouting distance to. Yeah, because what is the there. field size for the, the kayak championship? I mean, I don't know how many people qualify. It could be in the 300 people, 250 people actually qualify, but then 160, 64 actually fished it out of the 200 and something that qualified. 
So next year you might have 300 people qualify and hopefully 200, 225 fish it. Still pretty big field size, size, but. Um, What's up, Ralph? Thanks for all you do. Hopefully you get out on the boat soon. Yeah. Let's see what else we got here. Yeah, what else here in the comments, guys? I, there was a lot of them up at the beginning too when we were, we were rolling. That. Yeah. Uh, How many Tarquito batteries did you burn through during the classic? So that's a good question. I borrowed a bunch from uh, some friends, and huge thanks to those guys. I couldn't have done it without that, and without like you know the rock guard that's uh, made by Innovative Sportsman for the Torquedo and and some other components made by them. But I borrowed enough to where I had about, I think I had seven total. I never use seven, but torpedo batteries actually take a long time to charge uh, right now. They have a new one coming out, but they're quicker. So by the time you get off the water, you get back, you actually need like a second set. So, but I had seven total with me um, for the event just in case. And I was using, so how many are you bringing on the like kayak? Five. And then you can manage the, manage because i can put two in the hatch in front of me one in the uh little cubby that's in front of me on in the crescent kayak show it's a fish finder cubby basically but it, the torpedo battery fits in there that's three in front two behind me i could have put more behind me in a yak attack black pack crate that i use sometimes but i, I had you know five was enough and also had um they're like 29 amp hour because they're 12 volt they're not i think a 12 volt so they're not like, it's not like you can choose to get, you know, your X2 125 amp hour, and just bring two of them or whatever, hundred amp hour batteries. You can't. So you have to actually have to pile, but they're only like 13 pounds separately. You just kind of have to pile them in there and then change them out when you're, you're dead. But, uh, you can manage the, the Torquedo throttle does show you like how, how many more miles you have at that exact speed you're going. So if you slow up, you can manage that your, your distance, your range overall, so you know you got to hit it hard when you're going up some of the swift stuff, and, and that burns a lot more energy. And if you went if you went full speed, they'll go like three three and a half miles maybe just at full blast. That's going six point seven miles an hour on flat water. So you definitely need to know how to manage that. It's this it's man it's so similar to what Jason Christie did when he won the Sabine. You know he just managing. He I was had just his, thinking. Drew Gregory is too successful. People might say they're not complaining about the number of batteries he's carrying and limit those. I mean, <laughs> it, would it be any different if it was just two and it was a hundred, it was 250 amp hours, but it was just two that were 125. Like what's the no, difference, no. right? It's like, I don't know, but um, yeah, it's, that was, not, it's, it's making the sport too predictable when you can carry seven batteries. True. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, fortunately, I didn't need to put that many on there, but I definitely had the extras there at the house and charged up ready so so I could. So there's a, there's a specific battery that Torquedo uses. You can't just hook up any 12 volt battery to it. No, so you I'll can't. Think. It's got a data port, so it gives you all that information on that throttle. You know, your, your how many watts you're using, your speed, your range, all that information is there, and uh, you know it's super helpful. Again, it's like Christy. He had his Garmin connected to the fuel and everything when he went up the Sabine and he knew exactly how much gas it took to get there and, and how much he had left. You know, it, if he didn't have that, he, he he admitted he wouldn't have been able to, to have won if he didn't have that, that knowledge, that Intel right there on the screen. Right. So. Graham wants to know if we're ever going to see me in a kayak, I like the idea of fishing out of a kayak. I like the idea of fishing. Cause like, in Minnesota, you may not know this, there's no shortage of water. Yeah. We have a lot. So, like, <laughs> there's a lot of those lakes that don't have ramps and little, like, neighborhood lakes, and most of them have fish. It, it's very attractive to be able to go and tap some of that water. Oh, On the yeah. flip side, time is the biggest constraint, not, not money, right. not, right? So, it's like, if I really, I don't use my Camus as much as I want, so I feel like maybe when my kids get out of school and time hopefully becomes less of a premium then i could see myself splitting uh mm. resources yeah dabbling uh, and that'd be cool man for sure and then you see a lot of bass boat guys kind of going over into our world every once in a while you know ike obviously you think carl fished yeah. one i've seen was, i'm kind of surprised more of them don't do it as an opportunity right like mm -hmm. i mean we've seen uh what's the guy from new jersey um that won gunnersville like two years ago on the um 
the kayak wanna, or the yeah he he's a, he's an elite angler but he fished oh uh, uh, oh De Palma yeah yeah GDP he's, yeah. he's like he's, I'm surprised yeah. I mean we see guys I mean Ike's done it a little bit not yep. that he doesn't really need to do it for but I feel like there's some of these elite guys they're good anglers you know kind I mean not saying that there's not good competition in kayaks but i feel like that's a yeah, you know these guys deep. that yeah th- there's guys that s- want to fish more tournaments to make more money i'm kind of surprised we're not seeing more of them go to palma a little mm-hmm. bit and try to you know sneak in a series of kayaks right. uh and and just use it as another resource a to more marketing for the partners they're already working exactly. with potential to win more prize money at a, I mean, uh, I mean, that's what GDP you can, did. In theory, right. It'd be like going between I mean, from one term to the next stop somewhere. You can, I mean, like, right. I mean, like Jay Lee and Ike, those yep. guys all the times have their kayaks on top, whether they ever use them or not, they're sitting on top of their, their toppers. Right. They're so they can park yep. their, park their bass rig at a campground for a few days and potentially enter a kayak tournament. Right. So I'm not yeah. surprised we don't see more anglers dabbling with that. It, it fit into the schedule last year for Greg, and this year I heard it doesn't from what the elite schedule is set up. It just doesn't fit sure. where you can really fit it in, unfortunately. Yeah. So I think that, that hinders some yeah. of them, but maybe they could just cherry pick one event, you know, it's it's or two. And, and for the sponsors, you know, uh, a lot of them are, are sponsored by, you know, whether the Johnson Outdoors, you know, or, you know, that makes Old Town. That's part of Old Town's, you know. So they'll get out there and dabble. You got – um. Like I said, Jordan Lee's with, with, I believe, is it native watercraft um, sponsors him, I believe. Yeah. So, and then Carl with Hobie and Ike also with Hobie, you've got some, it's good for them. Those guys who actually have those sponsors ties already, but I, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's just low cost of entry. It's another way to get out there and it helps both worlds. You know what I mean? It helps both worlds. Cause trust me, um, GDP, that's a good question. Elvis, he actually, I don't think he fished because he, he zeroed on the leaderboard and there's no way in the world that he zeroed. You know what I'm saying? So I just don't think it fit his schedule. I know he's got a young, him and his, and his wife have a young, uh, you know, child, a young boy. And I, I'm sure something about time constraints or commitment was, it's just probably too hard for him to I make mean, it, but he did pay the entry fee. The expo, was, not I that I was like he, looking for him, but I don't like remember walking past him anywhere. I never expo. saw him. I don't think he actually, I think he probably paid to be in it thinking he was going to fish it anticipated and something probably came up because I didn't see him at Bass U didn't see him anywhere at the event. And he's a good dude. Right. I mean, we shared water at lacrosse him and I did at the Bassmaster kayak series last year and he got six and I got seventh and couldn't have been, you know, I mean, I mean, nice guy, but I'm talking serious, good competitor. Like, I mean, knows all the right things to say when we were kind of like, we found the exact same thing. And you know, he's, he's savvy, bro. Savvy with, with talking and communicating on the water, but really, you know, you say like, I'm just going to go right up here. You know what I mean? But you know, or I'm going to go way up there, but then you don't go way up there. You go just a little ways. I mean, you, you know, you say he's just smart about the stuff to say and how to interact and, and, but be respectful at the same time, but no, he's trying to do what he's got to do to like be at the right spot. And, and uh, so anyway, appreciate Greg for sure. Good dude. Yeah. I think, I think that, that helps everyone right i think seeing more crossover and seeing more people dabble Definitely. both ways is good for for all the leagues 100 percent, and that's why i stopped and talked to you know i've got a lot of good friends on the elites stetson matt airy i mean a lot of i'm pretty pretty on close with them um and other ones not as much but it's it's cool to see them and i stopped to get pictures because i want them to just continue to see kayak and see the, the value and and, and like, it was cool though, like Polinick and I stopped to him in the boat yard to talk to him for a minute. He's rigging up for day two and, uh, you know, super nice. And and he was like, I know who you are, you know? And that, that was, that's cool. Like, we're kind of like, we're trying to get to that level where more and more folks in the overall bass fishing world kind of like know kind of who we are and what we're doing. And, and they just respect, you know, I think the level of competition that's out there again, we're not as deep at the, as the elites. We're not saying we're as good as any of those guys, but we definitely choose this for a reason. And, uh, and there are some, some hammers in the sport and, yeah. and you'll see, Ike will say the same thing. And, and Greg and everyone like, you know, I know those guys have won one, but you, you get in these events and you're like, Whoa, like I thought this was going to be easy, you know? And it's, there's been some times that some top really good anglers on the boater side came over and did not go so well. Cause there are some other nuances you have to learn about a kayak. You sure. can't just crank up and go 70 down the, the lake to another spot. You, it, 
There's a lot of different ways to land a fish. The, the, your rod and reel setup has to change a little bit. Um, get During a little a bit fish, stouter. That's the skill that you need to develop. <laughs> like like what? measuring and, and like yeah, oh yeah, it's uh, all measuring different. and entering and not dropping your your catchboard or your phone and like yeah, there's like, a yeah, lot not, of stuff like yeah. that. Absolutely. I mean, just the just my rod and reel setup changes because you can't take some giant crow hop and lay into them two steps back like Chris laying on the deck of a a bass boat and get them. You, so you need to have a little bit stouter setup. You know what I mean? You're, you're creating slack as you're moving forward with your kayak, with your motor or your pedals or paddle, whatever, just like going on high on a trolling motor down the bank, you know, just ripping down the bank, like Stephen Brown with a chatterbait, you're creating that slack. And on a bass boat, he can lay into him and, and walk backwards if he wants and just keep get, you know, cause you can feel if you're, have caught bass long enough, you can literally almost feel from where the point of that hook hits their, mouth to where it gets to the barb you can almost just feel it get in and you know how much pressure you need to that point and you just you changes your setup and that the 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 mechanics of the of the hook set all of it it's you got to learn it it's all new so that takes a little time yeah, and some like of the guys even to some degree the rods you use in a bass boat don't 100 translate right like you might power up right in you a kayak because you bit. know your your vessel is going to give where your body doesn't exactly. give right so they're line sizes 100%. yeah and so those yep. guys have definitely had some success but they've also realized man this is this is tough this is competition's fierce over here too it's only going to get better yeah so um so that you use more high speed reels then i do i mean i use like eight eight to one eight three to one whatever it is yeah. uh been with 13 for eight, like eight years whatever and just the highest speed they got is what i always Always use. Things I will be doing some more classes doing? for Bash U. Um, yeah, I'll, I'm sure I'll do some more. I did a good one on a jig, which was actually one of the baits that, that I use in this event. It's just always a player. Um, and I won Grand Lake on a jig and a spinnerbait. And this, you know, jig and spinnerbait was pretty key in this one. It's just Oklahoma. I mean, look at Adam Rasmussen. That's, that's what he had. Same combo up there on Grand. Mm -hmm. You know, Hamner obviously sh showed us a different – you know, card up there, something that can get done, but yeah, I'll do more classes whenever they ask me next, but I actually do some personally. I'm probably going to sign up for uh, the fish tips because uh, Austin's been on me about that for a, a while. And uh, he's, he makes some good compelling arguments. You can't, sure. you can't, you know, if it's legal to go hire a guide and they can give you way points and give you all the information, which it is. I mean, why, why should the anglers, the pro anglers not get paid for, some information, some tips and things that they know. And so I might do some consulting and, and but I do also uh, offer a, a once or twice a year, I'll offer virtual classes where we'll, we'll get on StreamYard just like this, Rich. And I'll allow like 10, nine people to be on there at max. And I'll do a class and I'll teach people how I use Google earth pro, how I use the USGS river gauges, how I use far wide. It's an app that's got a, uh, you know, mapping on it and, and as well. And it also has GIS data, so you can see public property and things like that, ways to get in and access to scout water. Because you got to think about it. You guys drive around the lake. You want to see the whole lake in practice. Some people want to see the whole lake if it's a new lake. Uh, or you've at least narrowed it down to a part of the lake you want to see, and you drive around and see it. And you know from experience what what water clarity, what temperature, what vegetation or structure, you know whatever you want to fish you know what you like to fish. And for us, we drive around and do that. So using that tool, that far wide app with that map that shows the GIS data is pretty, pretty crucial for me to be able to like take that Tacoma into these four wheel drive roads sometime and just get eyes on the water. Just see what it looks like at this Creek, at that Creek. How does it look like there's life there? Do I see birds, bait, whatever, and quickly start to assess that fishery and understand which, which rivers and creeks are the most fertile and the ones that I'll have success at, but, but yeah, I'll do some of those seminars and the virtual seminars for sure. Yes. Yeah. So I guess is that stuff you talk about on your YouTube channel or. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, well, I promote it on my website. Drewgregory.com is where it'll be. And I'll promote it just on social media, but then it actually will be over Streamyard, and then we'll, well, I'll save it. You know how this can save the recording and I'll send it the students in the class a link to have that forever. They can go back and watch it if they forget how to do something. Cause I mean, I don't use a graph. So I actually transfer my pins from Google earth pro my waypoints to my phone. So I got my phone out there and I can see those exact pins right there. You know, I won't have Culver, the satellite creek, the yeah, whatever the sandbar, yeah, I mean, whatever you were. Yeah. 
take this history photo to the lowest point possible for a lake. Like we all know to do. We've, we've seen, you guys have all seen that you can do that. Um, so take it there and I could even put pin a brush pile if I was going to fish the lake or a rock pile and transfer it to my phone through Google earth pro through dot KML or KMZ file, get it to Google, uh, you know, maps on my phone and literally could, could triangulate and see where that pin is and see where I am with the blue dot. Even though the satellite imagery, the water's higher, I can still hit that, that piece of structure I'm trying to fish. So yeah, um, it's, it's pretty cool. I teach, teach the folks how to do all that kind of stuff. And I think what a lot of people want me to teach is tournament strategy and the thought process and, you know, these online tools and stuff like that, but also just the strategy of everything from pre-fishing to tournament day and just, you know, teach people stuff like that. So it's pretty cool. I'll do more of those. At, at, like said, since we've been talking the Bassmaster for the regular season and then for the championship, do they have practice limits and information? Like what kind of? They do. You can uh, pre-fish about a week. So I think it started on Friday, maybe. So maybe it wasn't even a week. This one, I think our pre- practice started Friday. So we had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Because that tournament, so maybe it's just five days. Most tournaments are about a week. You get a week to, to pre-fish and that's it. So it's off limits for like a month before that, that one week. And then there's definitely information rule and rules. There's certain times that you can't contact or use a guide or call a guide. I think within that off limits period. So maybe before the off limits, you can, uh, I can't even remember. I don't even, I don't like use guides or do any of that stuff. So I don't even know. You have to go read the rules exactly, but it, there's definitely limits on when you can do certain things and can't do just like the opens elites anything else well it says shout out to drew he's the reason he started throwing huh, spinner baits cool. and having success with it so but you do have you post some of your tournaments and stuff on your youtube channel right i mean i post some. more on instagram like just short okay. clips these days just it's gotten tough man i mean i designed the kayaks i fish out of right i i have a bait company i'm working on i started uh, I, I've got that new kayak adventure series presented by GoPro that I'm doing. I'm fishing these tournaments. It's just too hard. I got a wife and two kids and three dogs. It's a lot going on, but you know, like we all have so many things so going Instagram on. Instagram is the best place to Instagram keep up with for short memory. little clips. And then sure. that's why I decided, so you could either do it two ways. You can, you know, Alex Rudd, good friend of mine, uh, just he's pump, constantly pumping out content right on, on his YouTube. And that you can monetize YouTube that way, give out a lot of cool tips, information, videos constantly. And then you're getting paid from the views and from sponsors because of how much you're out there posting. I'm a little bit the opposite. I post, you know, fair amount on social media. I'm pretty good. I'm not, not the greatest, not the worst on YouTube, not, not the greatest, not the worst. But what I would rather do is instead of giving the world all the information, because I could definitely go on YouTube and start posting. I mean, I could do it Randy Blockett style, not even needing to show any video clips just explaining and teaching and get a lot of views for that but that it just takes a lot of time to do that and what i would rather do is instead of giving the world all the information get paid from just this small group of people who want to take a virtual class or buy my fish tip when i when i go on there or whatever and then i actually have this cool bond between these you know few people that kind of learn that i get to follow along with them get to know them follow along with their story and their tournament success and they get to know me rather than the other way because i don't have time to do it the other way if you got if you want to get paid youtube you got to go all in on youtube man i mean like tons of videos constantly posting to monetize that that's like a full-time job and i have too many other things going on uh you know to to go that route with it and just kind of prefer the other other route. everybody knows youtube is easy drew come on yeah right piece of cake so easy um there you that go. is true, Omni-tasting. Brian. We are uh, down to the last few days to use uh, the hell of ass discount code at Omnia. Of course, we'll have a new code next month. But if you want to cash in and grab some stuff, there's the code on the screen. For those not watching, they can find it in the description in the uh, the podcast or the video. Um, but yeah, Elvis, back to your comment. Yeah, that's cool, man. That that you know, me throwing a spinner bait. It's it's an old school style, and it works. A, a lot in moving waters. It really does work in moving water. So if you're a river and creek guide and stained water, if you're, if you're fishing wood and, and stuff where a chatterbait, it, you know, gets hung up a little bit more than that spinnerbait, it's it's a little bit forgotten about, a little bit lost art. It's kind of coming back a little bit. You see people kind of realizing that, you know, 
you can definitely skip a chatterbait and, and other things like that, that the spinnerbait can't do. And, and chatterbait's great ripping out of grass and stuff, but there are times where you just can't beat that, that blade and that Zero thump of the spinnerbait. You just can't beat it. So. And that spinnerbait comes through wood so much better. It right? does. So wood is, yep. Big deal. Cool. My bait that's company, cool. I see swim bait on a prayer. I'm going to be making more like jigs and that's spinner baits, buzz baits, wire baits. That's what it's going to be. And uh, we'll announce the company. I won't say the name right now, but it's going to be pretty cool. And it's, uh, yeah, kind of focused on a little bit more so moving when, water. When would we expect to see a, a formal announcement on that? And I've been working on this for years now. It's into the years. And it's not, it's what's crazy is there's a bog down in, in our industry, like, on manufacturers and OEM manufacturers and actually who can like just get it finalized and done. It's, and then there's also sure. the bog down in the R and D side of things is you just want it to be perfect. So it's coming out. Uh, we're going to have some cool stuff like that, you know, jig heads. So I'm going to have some signature baits from some top anglers, you know, looking to do one with Russ Snyder's Jeff little. Um, so we're getting there and it's, it's in the works, but I can't even say, I thought we'd have this thing done and up, but you know, a year and a half ago. So do I like throwing the frog? I, I mean, I like throwing the frog, not as much. I'll tell you, this is a cool question. Actually, the frog I like throwing, it's a unique way to throw a frog. I throw a Z man goat toads. So it's not the, the, uh, the hollow body frog. I throw, the, I throw some hollow body frogs. Don't get me wrong, but I like to throw that Z man goat toads on a double hook. It's the same hook that you like the Berkeley fusion. That's got the weight on it. It's like a ribbit hook, right? It's got mm -hmm. the weight, the two hooks, but you, but, the Z-Man elastic doesn't work with the, uh, the screw locks, uh, hitchhikers. So you got to take that off. You got to punch a hole through your, your elastic bait, uh, by the nose. And what you actually got to do is because it's a double hook, you know, you can't just start it on like one hook. You actually got to push it through the nose first with the hole you've made and then get your legs on. And I use that hook and I use the one that's got a weight on it. One eighth ounce because the last tech is buoyant. So it actually makes it fish like a one sixteenth you know, but with the weight of a one eight to cast it, throw it good. So when you hold your rod up and you, you can swim it on the surface, it swims right on the surface. It kicks like the ribbit toads or the zoom horny toads kicks really good. Hold the rod up high. It swims on the surface. Just like we love to fish frogs and see those top water eats. But here's the kicker. Here's what I love about it. this is some juice. If you stuck around to hell bass live late in the show, some real juice frogs swim under the water more than they do on the surface. That's their natural form. They jump off the bank. You don't see them. They're down there doing their thing swimming. So what I do with that one eighth ounce is actually slow roll that. It can go down about two feet deep, two, three feet deep. If you just go slow and you can pulse the reel, you just pulse it and the legs just kick like a real frog, like how it swims and it kicks. So I'll run that by a cypress tree, not on the surface. Some just slow rolling it and swimming it and just pulsing that reel it just swim it, just swim the thing. And they hammer it because they're used to seeing frogs swim under the water. I mean, that's, it's not just a surface bait. We get locked into that. Oh, a frog. It's a top water bite, but it's also under the surface too, for the bass. Yeah. So you're almost pulsing it like a swim jig. I mean, more. exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's doing, I'm doing it with a reel. I'm not like shaking. You don't want to shake it. You actually just yeah. want to start and stop. Yeah. You're, and so I guess some people may fish a swim jig like that. But, uh, you know, more, more times than not, I think they're shaking the rod tip. So I don't want to get people confused in what I'm doing. It's just, yeah, it's a stop. Not, and start. Not Alabama shake, but you're more just like, it's yeah. Yeah. Almost it's like a, the way TVD awesome. used to do that with his spinner baits. He would inflect a lot of yes action to the blades by being more erratic with his reel. Exactly. And those leg, it looks so good. You can do it with any, any bait like that style, but they just, they kick and like, and then they kick again, the kick and like, it's propelling that, that frog moving it forward. It's awesome. It's a great way to fish that bait and it stays very weedless. And here's what's all really good about it. That stout double hook. When you hook one on that thing, it is not coming off. I mean, game over. ever dude game over. And that's what I'm all about. Getting them in the boat, you know, for tournaments, that's, that's the name of the game. So any bait or technique that I can use a single, a big single hook or a big double hook in this case, I'm going to do it. So. Very cool. Yep. So when you do throw a floating frog, do you prefer the popping or the walking frog? Oh, uh, oh, uh, probably more like the walking frog than the popping. Yeah. You know, Z-Man has one, um, you know, that's like that that I throw. It's, it's you know, your basic frog. It's, you know, 
pretty good. I mean, it seems to catch them. I don't really know the place I'm at it. They bite it when I throw it. So <laughs> I trim off the legs, you know, and do what I can to, to kind of, you know, get it where I feel it's, it's how I want it and how it works the best. And, you know, I'm not, you know, Fred Rumbanis is, he's a pretty good friend of mine, man. And he's a good dude. He knows a frog more than anyone. He's given me some of his and he'll probably laugh at, you know, how I throw a frog or what I do with it. But he, you know, he loves the frog. That's for sure. And he, he's got the little Velcro the on top. Fred Rumbanis is a frog fisherman, but I don't think the world of his frog. Of his frog. <laughs> I mean, it, you know, I don't know much about it. I know he's given me some and, and it's, it's where I just, I know he said that one time he, he, he likes a different hook in it really. Like he could switch it to a different hook or something. And, and you know, but makes sense. I don't think the hookups yeah. are that great on his stock. If I'm being honest. Yeah. But well, I mean, cool. and that's the thing you, you make a frog, you see what happens, you get on the market and then you, you, like you said, you make your assessments and then the next version, so they're all prototypes for the next version of that bait essentially. So, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I love Fred, his, his son, the whole family. They're just really, really one of the best, best families in the industry, man. So positive. Absolutely. Right on. Yeah. Well, I feel like questions have kind of come to a simmer. So I feel like we got most people's questions done tonight. I appreciate your time. Yeah, buddy, Drew. man. Hey, you never know. Justin Hammer said it back in the media room. Him and I, you know, we're both on Team X2 batteries and we did a little video together. We got some, some pictures and I was like, dude, take it, take it for team X two, man, go win this thing and we can make it a clean sweep. And he did. But what was the funniest thing he said was all the media were lined up and they're like, Hey, sorry, Justin, we just got a few more. And, and they kept apologizing for how much time they were taking of his after, you know, he was in the lead on day one. Cause they know it's exhausting. And he <laughs> said, Hey, you guys might not want to talk to me tomorrow. I'll be here as long as y'all want me to be here. And it's kind of yeah. like laid back. Uh, and, I, and that's the way I feel, man. I, you got me you know, may not want to talk to me next year or next, you know, next month or whatever. And this is a, a good opportunity to get out there and share the passion for kayak fishing, what we're doing on our side of the sport to grow this for all of us and, and just kind of show folks, you know, what we're all about. So thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And hopefully you guys learned something tonight. Absolutely. I enjoyed it. Uh, it seems like the people that were here tonight enjoyed it. Lots of positive comments, a lot of good feedback. Aaron, best guest ever for him. So he made his night. Oh, uh, man. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little so, overwhelming yeah. sometimes. I'm a little. You. Yep. I go on but, the uh, tangents yeah, and time. filibuster, but I appreciate you guys letting me do it. And yeah. Can't wait. I'll catch it's you next true. time. I'm sure next live, I'll, I'll probably be on listening as a fan, bud. Appreciate what you do for the sport. <laughs> Absolutely. But, well, won't wait so long to have you back on. This was a good show. If you came in late, I think there was a lot of good nuggets uh, to go back. So whether you're on the Facebook or YouTube or the MP3, make sure you you rewind and be part of the replay squad. If you came in late, um, follow Drew Gregory at Drew Gregory Fishing on Instagram. Sounds like where most of the action happens. Yep. Um, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And as always, here to help you guys catch more big bass and suck less. <laughs>